How's everybody doing? Uh, we are live. I don't even know what the heck. The, oh, it's December 2nd. I, w- I was like, I can't remember the date because I'm so, <coughs> so lost. Welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live December 2nd, 2018. I'm your host, Matt Delaney. Joining me this week, Jeff Blackwell from American Atheist. How's it going? One of your attorneys, most, most of you out there. Uh, this does not create an attorney-client relationship? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's kind of like the, um, oh, crap, I'm going to screw it all up. Anyway, uh, we'll get into some stuff about uh, AA and lawsuits and everything else uh, shortly. i got a couple announcements to get out of the way. Um, first of all, uh, December 15th in the Dallas uh, area, I will be doing my uh, Magic and Skepticism show for the Metroplex Atheists. And it's going to be, I can't see this, um, well, between like 11 and 5 if, at the uh, 3220 Botanical Garden Boulevard, Fort Worth, Texas, 76107. Uh, anyway, you can look up more information from Metroplex Atheists or hit my Facebook page, and I'll post a link to that. Uh, if you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I'm looking forward to seeing you as I begin my long Christmas voyage uh, that I was going to cancel Uh uh, a number of my events got canceled. As I mentioned last week, uh, Pangburn Philosophy is uh, folded and in the process canceled the Day of Reflection that I was going to host on the 17th. Uh, the debate that I was supposed to do with Dinesh D'Souza on Thursday, this past Thursday, obviously uh, did not happen. And on the 6th, uh, four days from now, I was supposed to be uh, sitting down with Steven Pinker in New York, but unfortunately that event was canceled. However, I do have good news on that front. Uh, some of the people local in New York are putting together uh, a substitutionary event for the people who already have tickets and travel and all that stuff planned. Uh, I do not know necessarily know who to contact. There has been some some buzz on Twitter, and um, I will not be there. But they've found a substitute to sit down with Dr. Pinker, and so th- there will be something fun. Uh, and I greatly appreciate the people who said, you know what, we we all kind of get screwed with our pants on. And everybody lost money, and we had non-refundable tickets and. Let's just do an event, and congratulations, uh, and, and a huge thank you to Dr. Stephen Pinker, who's you know essentially funding this kind of hey, let's or, or at least willingly participating and facilitating the ability to have some sort of event. That's good of him. So uh, now, <clears throat> the atheist community of Austin, which is a wonderful organization of which I'm a former president. Produces a great many television programs and internet shows. Uh, the Atheist Experience, Talk Heathen, Nonprofits, Godless Bitches, Preaching Humanists, Atheist Roundtable, Atheist Interviews, Secular Sexuality, Truth Wanted, Parenting Beyond Belief, and I'm sure there will be more in the near future. Uh, the one that airs on Sundays prior to this is some of you might be familiar with Talk Heathen. Uh, and you were on today. I was. I thought you guys did outstanding. I but had a great time. One of the cool things that happened is. Uh, so if you're watching this on YouTube and it's live, off to the side is this kind of super chat thing where you can not only chat, but then you can make donations. And during the Talk Heathen show, there were a couple of big donors that uh, helped them raise $1,237.7 uh, in, in their, during the time of the show. And I just, you know, originally I was like, that's awesome. And I just want to come on and, you know, congratulate Talk Heathen for doing so well and to thank the donors there for, you know, contributing so that we can continue to keep doing shows. And it was phenomenal. And then Eric had to go and say, take that atheist experience. (laughs) And so here's what we're going to do. Normally we're on the air from 4.30 to 6 p.m., which means we stop queuing calls around 5.45 or so, knowing that we're not going to get to all of them. We take a couple, and then we go off the air at 6, and we do a, an after show, a post show, uh, for patrons where we take the rest of the calls. If we raise more than $1,237 in the... Uh, and I'm not going to... This is not like an every week. I'm not going to be coming after you all the time and blah, blah. This, this is a spur-of-the-moment thing. But if we raise more than to Talk Heathen did, then... I will, I've already talked to the call screener and the folks back in the booth and say, instead of stopping the queuing at 5.45 or so, we will queue all the way till 6.30 and I will stay here until 7 o'clock or whenever we clear out the queue uh, if we can raise more money than talk even. Only because Jamie threw down the gauntlet and I know that the people who watch the Atheist Experience, I know that there are people who despise me and if you despise me, you should donate to get your comment up to say how much you can't stand me and how much you wish you were watching Talk Heathen. Uh, 
And if, in fact, you prefer atheist experience to talk heathen, then you should donate more than that previous person so that your comment ends up at the top so that they then know, no, 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 no atheist experience is winning. And that is the full extent uh, of today's friendly competition. Letting the free market decide. Yep. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, in, in the end, it's just a way to make sure that we're uh, doing what people want, producing better and better shows, and are able to stay on and, and answer questions. Because I know the queue. Uh, and at this point, Jeff and I are going to talk for a bit, which means all the callers that are on hold are going to have to stay on hold for a little while. <laughs> but I'm so glad. I didn't expect to be such a draw. Yeah, so you're amazing. Great. And the cool thing is, is that no matter what happens, you'll be able to say, you know what? I went on Talk Heathen. They raised a frick ton of money. I went on Atheist Experience. They raised a bunch of money. People should just have Jeff on their shows all the time. I do have stuff I have to do, which I think we're about to talk about. I, we um, are. But uh, uh, now I have, you know, I. You and I haven't known each other particularly well or for very long, but I, I did get a chance to visit with you last mm. time I was in Washington. And um, I've always had a, a perspective about lawsuits with regard to the secular community at, at Broad. And there are sometimes lawsuits that I think are a bad idea. Sure. Um, the uh, Michael Newdow's lawsuits about removing In God We Trust or uh, from the money was, I thought strategically bad. I don't disagree with him. I'd like to see it come off. I just think it was a strategically bad decision, but I'm not the arbiter of that. And there are a number of different organizations. There's American Atheists, there's Freedom from Religion Foundation, there's Americans United, and then there's others that aren't even necessarily secular in their goals, like ACLU or Southern Poverty Law Center and things like that. When you, you and the rest of the, the legal staff are considering what cases you should take on behalf of American atheists or on behalf of the people who are wanting American atheists to take this up. Hmm. What's the process you go through on figuring out whether or not this is a, a good idea or a bad idea? Sure. So, I mean, for m most of the process, it applies um, to every complaint we get. Uh, you know, some someone comes to us with an issue and the first thing we do is figure out, and us it's usually pretty apparent, whether or not it is a legal issue or not. Mm -hmm. Plenty of complaints come in that are objectionable behavior that aren't legally actionable. Um, plenty of them are legally actionable but aren't the kinds of cases that we take because we deal with lawsuits that are um, – that involve the government um, right. because it's a civil rights organization. So if someone is having a dispute with their employer, we hand those off to – we direct them to the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or their state-level equivalent. Um, <clears throat> then if it's something that is legally actionable and is something – um, that is the kind of case that we would take from a broad constitutional perspective. Um, we figure out how best to approach it. Usually that starts by collecting all the information we can through FOIA requests, um, online searches, uh, basically getting all the possible information um, so that we can know the situation as best we can going in. Um, uh, then there will be a demand letter. Um, and at a certain point, there at a certain point in each case, we reach an inflection point where you have to decide. Um, it, the complainant has to decide. Okay, they're not playing ball. They're not willing to work with us to solve whatever problem we've brought to their attention. And we do think that's the best way to address these issues is to solve them through cons building constructive relationships and reaching a solution that's agreeable for everybody. In some cases, that is impossible. So the first question then is, is the complainant interested in pursuing a lawsuit? Because a lawsuit is a very long and arduous thing, even if you know, we don't charge our complainants for our services. We are you know, a nonprofit organization. We, um, you know, yeah, we don't, we don't charge them for, for legal work. Um, but it's still very stressful and still it's going to take a long time before you reach a resolution. Um, so some people choose not but the, to. But there's still money involved. I mean, it could be costly for American atheists to, to oh, actually certainly. pursue certain yes. Um, and, um, you know, we uh, often have to hire a local council to partner with. Um, and we have to, uh, very often, the FOIA requests cost money because uh, it takes employee time at the agency to do the searches right. and, and cost of copying documents and that sort of stuff. So there are certainly costs on our end. Um, the hope is that at the end of the proceeding, if presuming you succeed, you recover virtually all of those 
legal fees and expenses um, under the law from the government. Which, which raises a question of something that we've seen over and over again. There are some... There are precedents that are set. So, for example, the Texas state constitution has a provision that you can't run for office unless you believe in a higher power. However, that no longer has any teeth because of the Supreme Court decisions. Right. And, you know, we, and Herb Silverman fought this uh, in North Carolina, wherever it was. Yeah, I believe so. Um, what we keep seeing is some local city council will do something that's clearly already been ruled on in a dozen other cases of we're going to slap in God we trust on our sheriff's cars or we're going to have a, a, a Christian uh, prayer celebration before we start work with our public employees and all these other things. Quite often, I know that uh, American Atheists, Freedom from Religion Foundation and others will basically send them a letter uh, that I would think for reasonable people should have an impact and that is you are engaged in something which has already been ruled on many times as being in violation of the First Amendment and marginalizing. And yet some of these people go forward with it. And on behalf of, like, let's say I live in this town. Now this town is spending my tax dollars to fight something that they've already lost before they begin. I do want to correct you on one. The, okay. the in God we trust on police cars and stuff, the courts have said that in God we trust is the national motto. And sure. so, I mean, there could be circumstances where that would be an well, issue. Or was it a Bible verse he put on? Or oh, if it's a Bible verse, then yeah. 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 I'm trying to remember exactly what happened in uh, in, in Cleveland, Tennessee, uh, where there was the sheriff was doing that right. uh, on the police vehicles. That was, uh, I will say that was before my time. Yeah. But yeah, I think that was um, settled before it ever got to. And that's uh, one of the problems case. too is that in God We Trust is, since 1954, the national motto, mm -hmm. replacing e pluribus unum, which wouldn't have caused any lawsuits. No, far superior motto. Yeah. <laughs> superior in every way, not the least of which is that there wouldn't be so many lawsuits. And yet, so the, the court rules that because it's a national motto, okay, it gets to stay. Is there a path to, I mean, you know, is to there? addressing that at all? And is that anything that we should even be considering? Aren't th are there bigger issues with people's civil rights being violated or um, more blatant mm -hmm. uh, encroachments? Is there a, through litigation, is there a way to challenge the motto itself? Probably not at this point because they, it's kind of all already been addressed. Yeah. Now, the actions of, you know, um, whether Arkansas passing a law mandating it be displayed in every school classroom and school library, um, depending on how they reach that decision, you could very much say uh, there could very well be a claim that their decision to do that was intentionally promoting religion. Um, but all you would do is accomplish them removing those displays from those right. locations. Right, not the motto itself. You're not changing yeah. what the national motto is. Yeah. Um, so the solution there is political. Um, if you, if, if we want to change the national motto, and I know virtually everyone in the atheist, non-believer, secular community would like to see the motto changed, yeah. we have to elect members of Congress who will pass a bill that changes the motto. Sure. That's, so the way, the way we change what the, the law is, is through uh, electing representatives that actually fundamentally change the law or through precedents argued, essentially, hopefully from the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. However, th this, this for me, there's a couple of curiosities that, that I'd like to get to while you're here because sure. I, I don't often get to bend people's ear on this. Uh, the first is... I don't know what I'm in for, so... Yeah. The, the first is this notion that the Supreme Court has ruled on something... And yet there's a contingent, you know, it's a, like a 5-4 decision. So even mm. nearly most of the Supreme Court justices are disputing what the ruling should be. Absolutely. How fragile is a 5-4 decision compared with a unanimous decision from the Supreme Court? Um, it, it kind of goes to how much they value precedent, but is there a, diff a major difference in precedent on a 5-4 over a, you know, 7 I mean, in terms of every court below the Supreme Court... No, there's not. I mean, every judge underneath the Supreme Court is obligated to follow right. the Supreme Court precedent, no matter how big or small the majority was. Um, once you get to the Supreme Court, um, I think the five four decisions are certainly more um, 
fragile. Uh, so if you if you brought a case, you appealed it all the way to the Supreme Court. Is, is it reasonable to assume that they're more likely to even accept a case that was based on a five four precedent versus accepting a case that was on you know a seven two or you know an unanimous? Um, I don't know the answer to that question with any certainty. I think it's likely that they would be uh, more willing to take a case that is um, was a closely decided decision than one where it was nine nothing. There's no um, you know no one's written a strongly worded dissent or well reasoned right. anything at all. I I think um, yeah, it's much more likely that they're going to hear a case. Um, addressing a 5-4 issue than a unanimous issue. Yeah, because, I mean, when you go back to, like, um, the Supreme Court cases that happened around 2004, 2005 or so, where, if I, and I'm going to get this partially wrong, but essentially it felt like, I think it was Justice Breyer who invented a grandfather clause as saying the, the Texas one can stay because nobody really complained about it, whereas the Kentucky one has to go because... Uh, people complained right away, which I think was just a big message to everybody to, you need to complain. Yes, absolutely. Uh, get it on record. But, so we've got that sort of, uh, of decision out there. And, and, and by the way, the, the, the religious sphere is the only place in which that is true. A constitutional violation of any other clause, just because no one complained about it, doesn't mean that it's not a violation. Yeah. It's only when it comes to, I guess, Ten Commandments displays and whatnot. It was a very, it was actually the very first show I did, um, The Atheist Experience, was a, a week that Jeff D. forgot to show up. And I had just written an article about the, those Ten Commandments decisions uh, and jumped in and, and sat down on the show and talked about it because I'd done quite a bit of research on it. And it was incredibly frustrating to me for somebody to say, well, because people haven't complained, we can. How, how is that relevant? And and shouldn't it be patently obvious to somebody to say there are good reasons why people aren't complaining, and that's mm -hmm. because they're the ones in the minority position that are specifically being kind of implicitly silenced by these sorts of things, made to feel as second class citizens, especially on an issue in which um, uh, there there are certain issues um, where if a case touches on your um, private life, um, you can file a lawsuit anonymously because the courts recognize that there are certain areas where someone wouldn't want it made public that they sought an abortion sure, or that kind of thing. Um, and your religious beliefs are one of those things. So if the courts recognize that your religious beliefs can be grounds for you to not want to file a lawsuit under your own name, then surely they could recognize, but they haven't, that um, it may also be a reason that you don't want to pursue the lawsuit at all. Not because you're fine with what happened, but because you don't want the surus that would come along with it. Just one. You mean like not not wanting to suffer through what Christine Blasey Ford suffered through and, and sure, coming forward certainly. about stuff? Yeah, and yeah. it doesn't just apply to lawsuits, which is why I mentioned that. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have you tell me exactly what's wrong with my wonderful idea, okay? Which has been shot down once before, and that's this. I would like, it's not my biggest issue, but I would like to end the de facto tax-free status of religious organizations. I would, I, I'm fine with them publicly applying for and receiving a tax-exempt status on the same footing that everybody else has, where sure. they, they have to open their books and they have to show that they're doing something in the Final public interest. It's a, yeah. yeah, but not by default. And it seemed to me that I, a Buddhist temple here in Austin had to fight for quite a while to get tax-free status with regard to property tax because they weren't recognized as a religion. And it seems that all of these religions that are getting a de facto tax status um, have to, in one way or another, be recognized by the government as a religion, as qualifying for this. Absolutely. How does that not put the government in the position of deciding what qualifies as a religion and what doesn't and if the government is deciding what does and does not qualify as a religion, how is that not a direct violation of the First Amendment? It is. I completely agree with you. The problem is uh, twofold. Uh, if the court is going to hear your case, you have to have standing to file a claim. So you have to have shown that you were harmed, um, which is just, uh, and I don't want to waste a lot of time going into you know all the specifics of, of standing, but um, standing is one issue, and the other is the remedies that courts are empowered to impose at the end of a suit. So, um, number one, 
um, before you even bring a lawsuit, you have to find someone who's been harmed. Um, so it would be the Buddhist temple that has to go through a bunch of extra hoops to qualify. Sure. So they would have standing, right? Uh, you know, under most interpretations. I don't know about the newest justices or anything like that, but um, St- standing is like a hot potato in recent years. So it, yeah, it absolutely is. But let's set standing aside and say that the courts say that the Buddhist temple has standing. Um, the remedy um, is what is the court going to do to correct whatever happened to the plaintiff? Um, and in that instance, the, the, the harm that happened is they had to you know, jump through all these hoops, presumably spend money paying employees to respond to IRS requests or send people to meetings and whatnot. There are um, also just the constitutional harms. Um, the problem is, what you do to correct it is not to say, okay, um, everyone has to file a 990 and do all that stuff because that doesn't change the situation for the Buddhist temple. The Buddhist temple, everything would be the same for the Buddhist temple. They would still have to file their 990s, get um, certification from the IRS as a 501c3. So the only, only thing the court could rule is to give Buddhists the same exemptions that others are given? They would have to get and the— And not yeah. change the way— They they would not say, okay, we're just doing away with the, the exemption entirely. How could you possibly get standing to show that, for example, the Internal Revenue Service, uh, as a matter of policy, is essentially violating the First Amendment and this needs to be corrected? I would argue that— Essentially, any taxpayer whose money is paying the IRS to make those distinctions has what's called taxpayer standing. However, the Supreme Court has disagreed with my point of view um, and the point of view of a number of other people I've talked to um, in a number of cases that say you can, as a taxpayer, you have the right to file a lawsuit for violations of the Establishment Clause, but only if the expenditure of your tax money is specifically laid out by an act of Congress in a way, if, if Congress passed a law that said, we are going to grant, um, name your megachurch, uh, $150,000, that would be challengeable just by virtue of me being a taxpayer and some of my money is going to that. But if it's, we're allotting this money to the IRS to enforce, um, Section 501c3 of the tax code, nothing about that expenditure violates the Establishment Clause. It's only the discretionary side of things by the executive department or the executive branch that is um, violative. So you wouldn't have taxpayer standing. You'd have to be one of the people who is directly impacted by the actions of that executive department. It's, it's really troubling that there could be a clear policy in place which, under a, a fairly straightforward and plain reading of, of the First Amendment, would be in violation of the Constitution, and yet we don't really have a way to rectify that. That's I completely agree with you. I mean, it's the same thing with the motto. How do we the get motto, you on the Supreme Court? Because <laughs> I would rather have you there than at least half the justices who are there now. If you want to run for president, then... That's not in- <laughs> Um, I have a feeling I would have a, a – well, I don't know. I, I don't know if an, if an atheist judge appointed to um, the Supreme Court would have an easier go than Kavanaugh did or, uh, or a tougher go. Um, I don't know. Let's not go down that rabbit hole. I got a couple quick questions before we get to sure. calls. Um, number one, what do people need to know about – when they should contact American Atheists or some other organization about potentially raising a lawsuit, and what have you got going on right now with American Atheists? Sure. Well, um, you can contact us when you encounter um, something in your community, um, frankly, or elsewhere, um, that um, you think may violate um, the Constitution's um, uh, restrictions on you know, religion influencing government um, and religion and government influencing religion. Um, a lot of a lot of my job is to um, let people know, hey, actually, this is, uh, you know, thank you for your question. Um, this isn't really a violation because right. X, Y, Z. Um, and I have I'm 
happy to send those emails. So if people see something that's questionable, absolutely bring it to me because sometimes it's actionable and sometimes it's not. Um, as far as what we have um, going on right now, we have three, three cases in active litigation right now. One in Houston where a student sat for the Pledge of Allegiance for um, reasons both religious and philosophical. And, um, and, and how is this even a thing? Didn't the, didn't the Jehovah's Witnesses already fight this? In like 1946, they fought this in a case called West Virginia Board of Education v. Barnett. I mean, it this said, is one of the ones where if, I think if you sent a letter, the school would go, yeah, we kind of screwed up here. And instead they didn't. They doubled down. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's really troubling that it, that it has come to this stage. Um, this is actually kind of a unique case because um, and I don't want to talk too much about it because it is inactive litigation. Sure. I'm dealing with it tomorrow. But um, um, this is a case that involves a claim for monetary damages uh, because of uh, the, the impact that four years of bullying by students and teachers had on a student. Um, our cases usually don't involve damages just by virtue of, you know, someone imposing, you know, their religious perspective on a community doesn't generally involve out-of-pocket expenses. Um, Although I would think that maybe if a principal... I'm getting to it. Uh, if a principal uh, basically set up a, a student to be marginalized and suspended them, that can affect their academic ability, which can affect what college they can go to and what jobs they get, and so you could have this cascade. Absolutely. Though they're proving it and proving proximate cause uh, that their actions were the cause of those damages is mm. would be a challenge. Although you could probably find expert uh, expert witnesses to to discuss the impact that it would have on a student, yeah. Um, one we recently filed just at the beginning of October is against a state senator in Arkansas named Jason Rapert, who um, has the practice of blocking atheists um, who criticize his point of view on um, church-state separation issues from his official social media accounts, Twitter and Facebook. Um, this is a case that's following in the footsteps of the uh, Knight First Amendment Institute's lawsuit against uh, the president over his um, implementation of his at real Donald Trump Twitter account. You, you, look, you look like you have a question, so I'm going to pause. I, I would like for you to explain this because... Um, and it may just be that I haven't fully processed this. Have we gotten to a point where somebody's Twitter account, um, even if it's like the official Twitter account of a representative, would somehow, it would be, well, I don't, I don't understand. Why can't Jason Rapert block whoever he wants? Because essentially social media is the 21st century town hall. And a just as a... Lawmaker can't say, um, you know, uh, uh, constituents who uh, disagree with my position can't come into my um, legislative office and and talk to me. Uh, they can't or exclude them from not campaign events, but you know, legislative town halls that they hold with their constituents. Um, you can't exclude people from a conversation that you have created a forum for in social media. Um, Can't you? Like if I did a town hall mm -hmm. and we just ran out of room, then we're excluding some people. Sure. But also if there were people who were disruptive in that town hall, we could have them removed. Absolutely. And, and so I'm wondering what, how something similar couldn't work. On, I mean, granted, running around just saying, hey, we're not letting black folks into my town hall. We're not letting atheists into my town hall. Yes, I get that's a problem. Um, this is this is a sticky wicket. I, I, I kind of like it. I am really looking forward to this case um, it, because it is very much the person saying, if you're an atheist, you can't come to the town hall. If you're black, you can't come to the town hall. Um, uh, and as well as after they've kicked you out of the town hall, um, bad-mouthing you at the event saying, oh, you know, we aren't allowing the atheist in because they're immoral liars and blah, blah, blah. Saying, I guess, um, the difference between Rapert and Donald Trump is that Donald Trump will let you show up and bad-mouth you while you're standing there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to a certain extent, yeah. Um, essentially, the government, by, by creating an official Facebook page for his Senate office, he's creating a limited public forum. And you can't exclude people from a limited public forum based on viewpoint. It's hmm. not... A conventional limited public forum, like a 
um, you know, town hall or what have you, but um, but it is the high tech modern version of the limited public forum. And um, I personally, I think the law is pretty clear cut, and there's no reason to say that it doesn't apply on social media just as much as it applies in a city council meeting. Yeah, it kind of gets down to you know the changing definitions of you know what's a forum and. Even in some cases, the difference between like opt in and opt out, or whether we're broadcasting information. So it's like mm-hmm. he can't block somebody from visiting his web page to see his announcements. And so he could make a case that, well, everything I'm saying there that's public policy that's important is going up on the website, so everybody has access to it. Right. Um, but other people are ha- other people are able to comment on and respond publicly to his statements or posts or what have you, um, and people with contrary views are excluded from doing the same. Yeah. Man, I, I'm, I lo- I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay focused on this uh, as time goes on because I find this incredibly interesting on a number of fronts about, you know, w- what are the limits of free speech and, you know, instead of blocking everybody, I could just ignore every atheist who posts. Um, right. Facebook has the, if, uh, Twitter has the capacity to mute a user that doesn't prevent them from seeing your tweets and, and engaging in conversation. You just would not see that person's conversation. Yeah. Um, so that that functionality is there. He just chooses not to use it, and instead in- excludes f- people from the conversation entirely. Hmm. Now, now I'm even more intrigued because I was only passingly familiar with what happened. And there's, a, you know, the the de facto thing in my head is, okay, it's his Twitter thing. It's not the only way people have access to him or his information. And you know, I don't owe anybody, even as a representative. Like if I if I'm elected to represent somebody on city council, that doesn't mean that I have to have an open door policy where they can come in and talk to me whenever they want. Um, I just happen to be open to engaging on equivalent grounds. That's right. I can't the, discriminate. The restrictions have to be neutral. Yep. Yeah. Which, you know, I would just shut my door. None of my constituents can show up ever. None of you get to talk to me. It's just all, you can send me an email. Send me a handwritten letter. Handwritten letters stamped through the U.S. Postal Service are the only viable means of communicating with me. You would be entitled to do that. Really? Even as though it puts a financial as... burden on people for stamps? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think so. Because, um, I mean, even coming to City Hall places a burden on you and your time and... Effort and that it's, mo- it's more money in gas than it is for a stamp. Probably. Yeah. For, for now. For now. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming down. If you, if you want to, uh, how, how do people get a hold of you at American Atheists? So I can be reached at legal at atheists.org. That's A T H E I S T S dot O R G. Um, yeah. Send, send them there. Go to atheists.org slash violation and you can report a violation that you have. Violation. In fact, I'd prefer if you see something that's potentially a violation that you do it that way because we have a specific method for cataloging all of the complaints we receive and it's much easier to do if they all come in through one portal. Yeah, you, you and Allison and others are doing great work for people. So let's try and make it easy. So use the violation submission thing if you think you have something that's suspected and Jeff will do his best to get back to you. You're ready to Don't message me on Facebook because those are not uh, – I'm seriously suspicious of the confidentiality of Facebook messages. I'm totally messaging you on Facebook now all the time. No, don't do it with legal issues. I'll direct you to my email address. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. It's all right. At least I know who my friends are because and- <laughs> Andrew will answer me. Uh, uh, just messing with you. Thanks so much for coming down. Are you ready Andrew to, to – is to- very reckless. <laughs> uh, you ready to get the calls? I'm um, going to get – I'm going to get a phone call from Andrew. <laughs> uh, so, sure. so what we've got here, by the way, uh, just in that short little 30-minute discussion, $1,407. <laughs> so we already beat the crap out of Talk Heathen, so we'll be here probably till about 7 o'clock. Thank you guys so much for donating. Uh, I, yes, this was a bit of fun back and forth with Eric and myself, and you know, we love each other. We're on each other's shows. It's obnoxious. Um, but I'm very, I, you know, I've been hosting the show for... For quite a while. 14 or 15 years. I don't know. Forever, uh, it seems. And I don't have any plans to quit. I'm constantly doing other things and, and I get sidetracked. But uh, don't ever think for a second that I don't greatly appreciate everybody who's watched, everybody who's called in, everybody who's sent emails telling me how wrong I am or how you know bald or fat or whatever. It doesn't matter. This has been such a huge part of my life, uh, and I don't ever want to take anything like this for granted. I am. You can ask the people in the back if I'm scheduled to be on a week, and for whatever reason the schedule gets messed up and I can't be here. I, I'm upset. 
I, I would be here doing this show every single day if I could. Uh, so thank you so much for everybody who donated. We'll go ahead and do a long show and uh, buckle up. It's going to be fun. All right. Well, uh, we, I want to start with somebody who we actually called in to talk heathen, and I asked him to continue or, or call in here so that maybe we could get to the clarification from a different uh, direction, and that's uh, Jonathan in Arizona. Thanks for waiting. You're on with Matt and Jeff, which is kind of like Mutt and Jeff, which is shows how old I am. How you doing, Jonathan? Good. Um, boy, that didn't take long to uh, get those donations, did it? <laughs> No, it works out pretty good. I, I, I'm, I, I was optimistic that we would, uh, that we would get there, but you never know. And since Eric threw down the gauntlet, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm thrilled anybody's watching or calling. So, what have you, what do you got for us? Let's dig in a little bit on uh, your questions about morality. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> when we were talking earlier, uh, uh, me and Jeff and Eric, I guess. Uh, I, I kept coming back to that if if morality is subjective only, that it, it seems to me it keeps coming back to it's just a matter of individual opinion or the opinion of the consensus or society or culture or whatever. Um, anyway, it seems to come down to it's just a matter of, of opinion. And uh, I don't think uh, either I wasn't explaining it in the way where, where Eris understood how I was explaining it or we just... Uh, he disagreed with what I was saying and he tried to explain, you know, why and, and his reasoning behind it. But I just, I couldn't find any other way to come back to it. Always seems to turn sure. out to come back to, uh, you know, a matter of opinion. Yeah. And I was sitting out there listening and, and what I heard, there was, there was some confusion of terms that had people talking past each other. And rather than rehashing everything that happened on, on Talk Heathen, and because we're going to be on here a long time today and have a lot of calls, uh, I figure the easiest way to start, and, and if this goes horribly wrong, then I apologize for making you wait around and call into a second show. Um, I'm just always optimistic that there's some other way to have the conversation. So let me start right. with this. Define morality. What do you mean when you, when you, when you say the word morality? Um, so I guess uh, if I were to replace the word morality with what is... Uh, right or wrong, you know, what is, what is good or evil in, you know, the common way that we understand these words. That, that's um, the problem. Um, you, you, and I, I'm in agreement with you. I, I'm not, I would agree. Somebody says, hey, define morality. Uh, it's about right and wrong. It's about good and evil. Uh, the problem is when you say in the way we normally understand these terms, because what we're doing there is just saying, oh, you know what I mean by morality. And in reality, when, if you say morality is about right and wrong or good and evil, and then my next question to you has to be the two-year-old question of, well, what does that mean? 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 You can continue down this, this passageway. At some point, I think we're going to come to agreement, we may have right now, that by and large what we generally mean when we talk about morality is how do we go about making decisions such that we live a better life, that we are doing uh, more good than evil, that we are doing more things that are beneficial than um, harmful. I is that all still on board with your, what we mean by right and wrong? Absolutely. Sure. Now, that makes all of this really easy. Because the truth is, no matter how you define morality, once you have a definition, you can then evaluate the consequences of actions with respect to that definition to see if we are consistent with it. So the, mm -hmm. there, there's a couple of concepts that I want to kind of clear up. One is that many times when people say objective morality, what they're actually talking about is absolute morality and vice versa. And these are two different things. And on the objective side, there's also two different components. There's the objective value, the standard by, uh, which we are going to use for comparison. And then there's the objective assessment, which is assessing the consequences of actions to this. I've, I've used chess quite often as an analogy. The rules of chess, we made them up. There's no, in the universe, there's no objective chess. 
Um, we've, we've made them up and we've changed the rules. We added in on passant rule and castling and things like that. We didn't. The people who, you know, changed the game centuries ago did that. But at the end right. of the day, the rules are ultimately arbitrary and chess could have been checkers or it could have been monopoly or whatever. But once we have that set of rules, we can evaluate whether or not a move is more likely to lead to a win or avoid a loss than it is to a loss. And we don't have to know everything about chess. We don't. We just played the world championship uh, over the last, I don't know, it was like from the 9th to the 28th or so. And Magnus Carlsen and Fabiana Caruana played in London. Uh, 12 games in the classical time format. Drew every single game. And if I'm correct, that's the first time that that's happened. It has ended in a tie after classical before, I believe, but not drawing every game. I think when uh, Vichy Anand did it, they still drew, but... Uh, they each got to win. You're looking at me like I would have any clue. <laughs> oh, well, sorry, chess geek. I'm a chess geek, which is probably why I end up uh, using his analogy. So they had to go to a different time format. Now, that's not a change in the rules of the game, but it is a change in the situation. And so instead of playing a longer game format, they played a shorter game format. Um, and sorry, I love Fabi, but Magnus whooped his ass. I mean, it was just win, win, win. And it's because under those different time constraints, your ability to process information fundamentally changes. Mm -hmm. And you're relying on, on different uh, heuristics in a way. You're still playing the same game. Now, does that mean that because Magnus was able to win three games, that he is absolutely the best in every possible scenario? Well, no, because in the previous scenario, he tied. He and Fabi tied for 12 games straight. Uh, and they both, you know, made some mistakes, but they both played wonderfully. I mean, it's some of the best games ever, which would bore everybody to tears because they were draws. So setting aside the chess thing, if the question is, is there such thing as an absolute morality? Then my answer is no, because I view this as the situation and the context matters. And so you could see there's no, there's no truism, there's no moral truth that is an absolute, that applies in every single scenario. You can come up with perhaps incredibly outlandish scenarios where it would be justifiable to do anything. And, and the prime example that we go to in, in moral thought is something of, oh, I'm putting a gun to Jeff's head and I'm telling him, okay, uh, you need to make a decision. Do I kill those two people or those five people? And uh, if you don't make a decision, I'm going to kill all seven of them. So now, at a discrete level, we have Jeff is making a decision about whether two people, five people, or seven people die. And those are his only options. And he's, yes, he's doing this under duress so that he's not going to have to worry about going to jail. But the fact is he's being put in a position where he's forced to, to make a decision that has moral consequences. And it may be the case that refusing to make the decision and letting all seven be killed may be morally superior. It may be that going for the five is morally superior. It may be that's two. Um, nobody's pretending that we have all the answers. And right. this is why I'm fine with the notion of, of situations. So if we set aside moral absolute... Can I ask you a question real sure. quick? Just regarding the two, five, or seven. Um, you said that uh, he's forced with a moral decision. Um, is, how, is it a, how is that decision... Uh, a moral decision. Well, the consequences of that action impact people's lives for better or worse. And as long as we're going to talk about whether or not it was right or wrong or good or evil, then the impact of, of, of actions on people's lives is, is the sort of thing that we would always have to consider, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, under like, you know, normal circumstances, everyday events, sure. Yeah, I mean, if you want to say, hey, it's, uh, it's good to skip the Atheist Experience TV show and go help the homeless, as Phil did today. We, <laughs> we miss you, Phil. Um, you, can say, you can say that, you know, that that's a good thing and if you want to, because that's about how it affects people's lives. Uh, banging two rocks together has no moral consequence unless perhaps you start a fire that kills people. I mean, you can extrapolate these things out. But if we set aside, I, I don't think there's any absolute morality. And so now the question is, do we, we can, in fact, make objective assessments with respect to a goal. That's just an obvious fact that I don't know anybody who would disagree with it. That if I say, mm -hmm. hey, morality is making the most money, it's not. 
But if we define morality as making the most money, now we can evaluate our actions to say, hey, did this earn me more money or did it not? So the real fundamental question at the basis is, do we have an objective value at the, at the core of what we're talking about with morality? Or mm. is this all you, just um, opinion? Well, if, if um, we agree that morality is about right and wrong, what we're really talking about there, as far as I can tell, is well-being. What benefits us and what detracts from our lives. And as long as we have that as a standard, then we are physical creatures in a physical universe where the laws of the universe dictate the consequences. It's not a matter of opinion that lopping my head off uh, is good or bad for me. This is just a, a fact derived from the way the universe works. And the only thing left to question, which you kind of questioned a little bit during Talk Heathen and other people did as well, and I realize this is difficult, is, well, why should I care about well-being? Clearly, it's subjective and a matter of opinion about whether or not I care about well-being. And you are, in fact, correct. However, I'll go with Sam Harris here because we're in agreement. Consider health. Health isn't particularly well-defined and what may be healthy for you, me may not be healthy for you. And there's always going to be uh, exceptions and examples. But by and large, we have a somewhat decent understanding of physical health and the food triangle. And, you know, we learn stuff and improve. If you were having a conversation about health, would it ever occur to you to say, why do I care about health? No. And for me... This is functionally identical to the questions about morality. I think people make it harder than it is. Health is, hey, about our physical health. And you can, you can divide that up into mental health, you know, how healthy your blood is or your lungs or your, how far you can run or all these things. All these go into health. And I think if you take health, that is a huge chunk, by the way, of what I would describe as just general well-being that, we're, that I'm labeling morality. At the end of the day, if somebody says, well, when I define morality, it's not about well-being, fine. Then that person is not talking about the same thing I am. I, I don't think that that's true because much, and I'm not accusing you of this, when I asked you to define morality, you went with right and wrong, good and evil. Isn't that functionally what we mean when we talk about well-being? that we want to live the best life we can, one that's beneficial to us, one that you know, doesn't uh, result in harm to us, the people that we love, the planet you know, broadly, et cetera, um, that we want to take the actions that are better and we're looking for an objective foundation to better. And this is identical to me to saying, I want to take the actions that result in me being healthier physically. And those are physical facts. So I think morality is a lot easier than people make it. It's just that what religions have done is given people the notion that there's some God out here who is like the fountain of moral truth. Not necessarily because he says it in the sense of divine command theory, but maybe because of who he is. The, the truth just exudes as part of God's nature. And there's a fear that if you, if you don't have that, that you devolve into chaos. Well, we can make up a new game, but we've got chess. And it doesn't matter whether the universe dictated, ah, here's the rules of chess. And if you lived your whole life saying, chess is only chess if the universe intrinsically dictated that these are the rules, and then you found out that it didn't, it wouldn't change the game of chess at all. It would only change your perception of it. And so this notion that we would devolve into chaos uh, or we would have no foundation upon which to make moral pronouncements is to me absurd. Because as long as you and I care about well-being, as long as you and I care about, hey, what does this action make you better? Does it make us better? And there's really some conflict in there. Nobody's pretending we've worked it all out. But if that's what we care about, then we can make objective assessments about our actions. And it doesn't matter that the foundation is ultimately arbitrary, although I would argue it's not. Because there's a very good reason for us to care about our well-being just as there is for our health. Does that clear things up a bit? You, uh, you've absolutely made, you know, there's a lot of good information in what you said. Um, uh, there was a couple things I wanted to, like, kind of touch on, uh, but I didn't want to interrupt you. I wanted to... No, it's fine. Thanks. Rest of your thoughts. Um, <clears throat> so all of that does make perfect sense exactly how you said it. And I don't think I disagreed with anything in there. Um, 
but I, I do have a question of um, if we're going to define morality as well-being, um, then I guess my question is, uh, is there any reason that I shouldn't only be concerned with my well-being and my family's well-being? Go ahead, Jeff. Um, well, because uh, if you, if that is all you do, if all you do is care about your own well-being, then there will be consequences for everybody else who cares about both your well-being and their own well-being. Um, mm. And frankly, um, if you – I think taken to its logical extent, if you care only about your well-being and your family's well-being, the best way to ensure their well-being – is to ensure the well-being of your community. Um, I, I am in complete agreement, violent agreement with Jeff, and <laughs> suspected that I would be. You can get to altruism through purely selfish means because the the part of the equation is that you and I have to share space on this planet, and what I do has potentially affects you, and what you do potentially affects me, and it's like you know, hey, your your question is like, why should I give a rat's ass about Jeff? I mean, that's really what that question breaks down to. And my answer is the same as Jeff's because our actions potentially overlap and have an impact, not only on our immediate lives, but on things like climate change and public policy and who we're going to vote for. And if I just vote what is in here, – here's the key. What you think is in your best interest may not be accurate. If, sure. you, if, you are focused, sure. if you're focused on your immediate gratification without consideration of the consequences, it, it's kind of like the – uh, well, if I could rob a bank and get away with it, why wouldn't I? Mm. Ah, because even if you get away with it, you robbing the bank has an impact on the broader society, which changes what interest rates people are going to get, how much uh, security is going to cost, whether or not banks go under, whether or not your money has any value. It may not seem immediately obvious, but the truth is we're in this really gross, ugly web um, where everything's intertwined. And it would be yeah. a horrible mistake to think that you, any of us, given a little bit of information, actually do know what's in our best interest. It takes a lot more work to figure out what's actually in our best interest. Right. I would only quibble. Right. No, I absolutely this. understand that. And that's uh -huh. that it's a uh, gross, ugly web. I think it's a rather amazing oh, set I of think interactions it, I, we have going on. Ug but ugly in the sense of... Messy. Trying to... Yes, messy. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong. It's a beautiful thing, but... I don't think those things are necessary in conference. I'll be the sap today. So. No, 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 we're good. Does that clear things I, up a I bunch, John? Um, yeah, it's, well, I wouldn't say clears a lot of things up, but all of it does make sense. Um, and I, again, I agree with everything you guys are saying. Um, uh, I did ask this question on Talk Eden, um, and I don't remember exactly what the answer was. Oh, yeah, I, I do remember what uh, Eric said, but I guess I, I'll, I'll ask you your opinion on uh, that as well. Okay. Um, so uh, we're talking about well-being, and, and, and you know, when I'd ask a question like, why shouldn't my well-being, my family's well-being be the only concern for me? Um, right. it, it, this question kind of comes with that, I guess. Um, so hypothetical, uh, a little outlandish, but I, I'm asking this question because it goes to the deep root of, is morality uh, more than just opinion? And this, this question, I think, might help me understand if it is or not. Um, if my son is starving and I steal from another family who is starving to feed my son to keep him alive and that family dies of starvation, did I do something immoral? Yes. And can you explain, like, why? Why was it immoral for me to keep my family alive? Yeah. I, I, if, 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 I wanted, if I, I wanted don't, to, my family dies, you know? Yeah. No, I wanted to give, I wanted to give you a succinct answer. And then, and then offer some uh, exposition. And that is, you may well have made the best decision you could make given the available information at the time. Because um, I don't know whether or not you knew that it would, you know, result in this other family dying. Um, that's what we're all stuck doing. So when I say that morality is easier than it's often made, that's about getting over these you know, metaphysical humps of we need some authority to, to say this is this. First of all, nothing, that, no, no objection you've raised and no objection anybody has ever raised 
with regard to secular moral systems is solved in any way by appealing to a god. So, mm -hmm. at, at best case, whether you believe in a god or not, we're still stuck in this same boat with regard to foundations because in much the same way somebody could say, I don't care about well-being, I could say, well, I don't care what your god says. So, it's possible for you to take an action that is ultimately immoral, which, appeal, which appears to you at the time to be the most moral action that you can take because you are not in possession of all the information and none of us are. So the best we can do is one, make the best decision we can make with the information we have at the time, but it needs to be coupled with number two, which is constantly strive to improve the pool of information we have with which to make those decisions. And so if you, if you and your son were, were starving and you stole from a family and it saved your life and you saw that it didn't really seem to impact that family at all, that would be fundamentally different from your scenario where they end up dying. If after you found out that that family had died, if you found yourself in that same situation again, are you more likely or less likely to steal food from another family? Um, are you, you're asking me if, yeah, if this I'm was sorry. a hypothetical situation? Oh, okay. I've told uh, I need to do a better, I've been told I need to do a better job of inflecting my questions uh, so that they rise at the end so that they don't feel like statements. So let's do that. If you, <laughs> if you found out that that family died and you came across a similar situation in the future, would you be more likely or less likely to take the same action? That was awful. You know, honestly, I, I really don't know. I mean... I don't That's either. Question answer because we're talking about like you know. The, but, well, the, the let me let me toss child, you know? let me toss the question back to you. When when you stole from in your scenario, once it's done and the other family's dead, it would you look at that and say, "Wow, I took an immoral action," or "Wow, I took a moral action," and bad things resulted. Um, I would think it was immoral just stealing from someone to begin with, whether they died or not. Yeah. See, that's the thing. There's a way to look at it like that. I remember during Katrina, um, people, things that would have normally been called looting um, were initially called looting and then recognized as, you know, survival. survival. And it gets to the, the example of, you know, Jeff and I are walking down the street and I have a heart attack and Jeff looks and behind the glass at this pharmacy is a portable defibrillator. And so he breaks the glass and takes the defibrillator and uses it to revive me. Well, it seems to me that he, despite the fact that he's uh, violated somebody else's property, broken their glass, which is going to be expensive, taken a product that doesn't belong to him to use without, all of those things would be wrong. And yet, it may be the most moral decision he could make to save my life. Mm -hmm. And so, nobody's pretending that we have solved all the hard problems in morality. It's just that I don't think the hard problem of morality is... Hey, why do we care about well-being? Or do we have a good reason to make the decisions we make? We should just do it humbly realizing that we're going to get it wrong and to try to correct afterwards. Um, and there are situations where you are forced to make a decision and you got to do the best you can. And I'd say that part three of that is realizing when you're actually not forced to make a decision. When, when you are, there's an option to wait um, that we just don't want to do. That's probably one of the bigger mistakes. We good? Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to, um, again, based on how everything that you've explained, everything does make sense. Um, it, it, does, it does come down to the terms, like you said at the beginning, um, how we define morality. If morality is well-being, then it's easy to, you know, say what is objectively better to reach this well-being and worse. Yeah. Um, all of that makes perfect sense. Um, it, to me, it, it, it begs the question of, uh, and this, I hope this doesn't come off like I'm just trying to be argumentative or just come up with stupid, you know, stupid stuff to say, but um, is there any objective, is there any objectivity to why well being should be, uh, nope. you know? Nope. So it just, you already know my question. Is, <laughs> is there any objective reason why I should care about health? Nope. Oh, you can make circular arguments. I care about health because it's in my best interest. Well, why do you care about your best interest? Well, I do. Uh, yeah, th there's no way out of that. But the truth is, right. 
when you get people down and, and you're actually being honest, I have yet to meet anybody who will flatly say, I don't care about my best interest. Yeah. Those people tend to not survive. <laughs> and we are the descendants of people who cared about our best interest. But at the end of the day, if, if Jeff comes to me and says, you know what, man, I give up. I, I just don't care about my own self-interest anymore. I then have a moral obligation to try to convince Jeff about why his, he should care about his best interest. Because our lives intertwine. We're not best friends going to weddings or anything. We may be someday. But at the end of the day, he's still important to my life and to other people's lives, and he's doing good work. And if he doesn't care about well-being, I think I have a kind of a moral duty to try to convince him that he does. Proselytize, man. Yeah. On that note, I'm, I'm going to move on to uh, some other callers. I appreciate it, Jonathan. Hopefully we work some stuff out, and feel free to give us a call back some other time. Thanks, Jonathan. It was a great talk. All right, Matt. You guys take care. Thanks. All right. Do you, do you have a preference for where we go next? Oh, you, um, you've got all the callers. I'll let you pick. Oh boy, um, I have a feeling the chat room will hate me, but I kind of am drawn to the weak atheism versus strong atheism discussion. Which which line? Uh, three, three. It is. Sean in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. You're on with Matt and Jeff. How are you? Hello, Matt. Thank you for taking my call. I have you on Bluetooth. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Yes. Okay, 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 perfect. Um, I'll try to be I'll try to be quick because I'm an atheist myself, and I and I do believe that the uh, theist calls are more interesting. Um, first, I wanted to uh, say thank you to Matt. Um, I don't know I, I don't remember quite how I ran across your video initially, but you've kind of uh, inspired me um, in a number of ways. One is to quit dancing around. Um, wearing the, the scarlet A on my chest and, you know, with my beliefs and just go ahead and go out there and be open about it. Yeah. And uh, two, uh, two uh, to do, you've um, inspired me to look into evolution more. And um, then I went further than that, like, is it a theory or a fact? And then I started reading about the difference between theory and fact. And I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole, but... Um, well, I appreciate uh, that. If what... If what we've said over the years has been beneficial to people, and it, it clearly has, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled, um, and by all means. But you had a question yeah, for us today. Yeah, uh, you've made, you've made uh, morality, uh, the way you explain it, to me, I think people overcomplicate it. It's very easy. I won't beat that dead horse because you've talked about it a lot. Where, um, so the weak atheism versus strong atheism, um, prior to listening to your show and really getting into my, quote, atheism, um, I used to intuitively the way I would argue the point when somebody would say, well, how do you know there's no God? Uh, my, my reaction would be, you can't really prove a negative. I just knew, um, intuitively that it was, it wasn't really on me to kind of prove it, but the way you explained that is really good. There's just some gray area there. Um, by the way, you, 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 you by, by the way, you can in fact prove a negative. You can prove lots you, of negatives. Yes. But go ahead. I remember a show where you talked about. I remember a show where you talked about that. I'm like, actually, that's true. Um, but but I don't want to get into that. But um, so basically, the gumball analogy, where basically somebody postulates there's an even number of gumballs. They don't have a good reason for that. Do you believe them? No. But you don't necessarily believe that they're odd, that's odd either. Well, in that situation. I'm in the position where I know for a fact there's a, a statistically a 50% chance that it's either even or odd, so I at least know it's 50-50. So I was having this discussion with a theist, and he threw at me something that I thought was an actually a, a good point because I brought up, you know, I'm an, let's say I'm an a-leprechaunist, you know. Um, I, is it on me to prove that there's no leprechaun? So he, he said, well... Do you, do you, is it that you don't believe in leprechauns or like most people, do you believe there are no leprechauns? And intuitively, I feel like I really do believe there's no leprechauns. And if somebody were to tell me, hey, there's um, somewhere on earth is an invisible magic dragon flying around. Not only do I not believe that, I, I believe it's not true. Although I do acknowledge I don't have a way to know it's not true. So the, you, you might sound like where I'm kind of going. With it. Go ahead. You, you might actually. I'm sorry. So knowledge doesn't require certainty. It's just, you know, in, right. in, in philosophical terms, it'd be a justified true belief. And we, whether or not we can get to truth is, is something separate. But you might. So the, here's the, the weak atheism, strong atheism, for those who are confused. Um, weak atheism is, I am not convinced there's a God. And strong atheism is, I'm convinced there is no God. It is 
there are different things. It's a philosophical distinction. I largely don't care uh, what label you put on yourself. Uh, my problems become with people, you know, you said something, and I don't think that you were necessarily wrong but when you were talking about the gumball example where you said you know it's 50-50. Um, you know that there's only two options, but that doesn't mean that it's actually 50-50. Uh, there's not enough information in the gumball analogy uh, because it could be the sort of thing where because of the size of the, of the jar, you could only get an odd number in there or something like that. Um, sure. Th that, that's just kind of nitpicking. I want to I get to whatever your question is and, and we'll let Jeff uh, have a shot at it here. Um, okay, okay, sure. So um, I'll just one thing one thing i've been convinced of is not to trust intuition is is to go purely with epistemology and i haven't studied it to the level that you have and so i feel like if intuitively if somebody well one whether or not a god exists there's no good reason to believe that the invisible magic dragon we can go down the list of all the ridiculous hypotheticals that are out there even though I have absolutely no way to falsify them, right. rational, my, rational, my, my rational mind tells me you, you cannot falsify them, so there's, you can't, there's no reason to believe it's not true. You just don't have a reason to believe it is true. But my intuitive, my gut, I guess you can call it, says that I really believe there are no magic dragons flying around Earth somewhere. You, 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 you kind of get the point I'm making with that. So how do I reconcile the two? The intuitive me and the rational me, and you know, because I I really do want my my intuition or my beliefs to my emotional beliefs to match my uh, my rational mind, if that makes sense. Sure, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I would want anybody to have their their rational uh, conclusions match their uh, match their beliefs, and I think um, you know part of the difficulty is all too often. Um, all too often you can have um, someone say, you know, I'm a, uh, I believe that there are no gods um, versus I believe that uh, what I say, I'm a strong atheist with regard to every god claim that anyone has brought to me um, uh, because inevitably in every one of those interactions, there has been something in the definition of the God that they are presenting that necessitates they, that, that the God is not real. Um, either, well, either within the definition or placing that definition in reality. Um, so I think um, that for me, the best way to rectify those is, um, you know, to explore the... Um, Claims that are being brought to your attention, um, and uh, and as fully as you can, so that you can conclude whether or not it's possible or or not possible. Because, um, uh, like I said, in every uh, every every God claim that's been brought to me, once I've explored it with the person making the claim. At least the version they're describing to me is not something that uh, could exist. Yeah. Um, this is this is a. I don't, there's there's whistling in the background. There's, um, actually, the so the um, the invisible magic dragon. Presumably, the invisible magic dragon does things, and you would be able to see the results of it and test the existence of the invisible magic dragon, even if it's invisible and magic. Um, you know. Otherwise, you're detecting the undetectable. Right. There has to be something about it that's detectable. Right. So, so the goal of skepticism is to, in the language that you were using, essentially get your intuitions to match up with your rational thought, uh, to train yourself so that your BS detector um, is tuned. Now, the I wouldn't get too I wouldn't get too hung up on the notion of falsifiability, uh, because it, while while it is essential. Um, Falsifiability is essentially about 
for lack of a better way to phrase it, absolute disconfirmation of something. There would be something that would show that this absolutely is not the case. But that doesn't, it doesn't change whether or not we can be reasonably confident. So this is about adjusting our confidence level. I'm an atheist, and by that I mean I'm a non-theist. I am not convinced that a God exists. I am also a weak atheist. I am also a strong atheist in the same way that Jeff is with respect to the gods that I've been presented with. I can't I don't hold a position about gods that I've never been presented with for the same reason I don't hold positions on any concept that I've never evaluated. But there is a reason why I can be uh, reasonably confident that none of the gods that people have put forward actually exist. Not just I don't believe them, but I believe they don't exist. And you could go with a simple kind of uh, probability argument. Uh, each one of the buildings in this picture will, will call them a god. And we, and they're all mutually exclusive. So only one of them can be the true God, if any. And if they are in a position where I can't tell which one of those could be a God, and it's still a possibility that none of them could be, that fundamentally changes the odds. It's not like there's, you know, 10 buildings here so they each have a 10% shot. Uh, one of them is a God and none of the rest are. So they all have a 90% chance of being wrong. And because I can't tell right. which of them is the one that isn't, then I have to consider them equally, give them all a 90% chance of being wrong. And this is an oversimplification because not all gods are equally ridiculous. Some of them are, you know, if you say that, well, there's a god who, uh, uh, whose very existence makes it possible for human beings to flap their arms and fly to the moon. Well, clearly that God doesn't exist by definition because it's, it is contradicted by the, the actual facts that we can't flap our arms and fly to the moon. Uh, we, we can flap our arms and direct people to create a spaceship that will fly us to the moon. Uh, so that's probably how an apologist would in, re reinterpret that. At the end of the day, if you're convinced that there aren't any gods, here's the secret that doesn't in any way change the fact that anyone who is asserting that a God exists has a burden of proof. Yeah. Your inability yeah. to disprove a God, a particular God, like I can't, I can't disprove this one. I can make a, a broad argument about the possibilities, but I can't disprove this one because you've presented me with an untestable, unfalsifiable proposition. Does not mean I am irrational to think that that is not God. Right. It sounds like the uh, the answer might be from from what you said as far as apportioning your beliefs, because uh, I think maybe I was thinking of it um, too black and white as far as I believe X is not true or I don't believe X is true, um, that there's scaling involved. Yeah. The, your, your claim is... Your claim is very large. There isn't a shred of evidence, and by, I know, by the way, your claim would involve violating n natural laws that we, we you understand universally apply to everything. And, there, so, and if your claim was true, there would be evidence for it. It's, you know, if somebody says, oh, Matt's got a so, dead body in his trunk, and we go out and look at my trunk, and there's no dead body, and there's no hair and fiber or evidence that there ever was a dead body, then we have essentially proven that that claim is as, as not true as we can get to. Yeah. So okay. don't get, don't get yeah. too hung up on the fact that it's entirely possible to have a reasoned belief that you right. cannot demonstrate to a certainty. And so if you can't demonstrate it to right. a reasonable certainty, then just make sure your confidence level is proportional to what you can demonstrate. So I'm convinced right. that there are no gods, and I'd say I'm, you know, 60, 70, 80 percent convinced. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that's, that, that solves everything. By the way... Um, uh, just real quick side note: I'm a I'm a huge avid chess uh, fan myself. Are you rated by uh, by any chance? Not officially, no. And and I'm so bad okay. at the moment that I don't even want to tell you what a provisional rating would be. But it's <laughs> it's wholly unimpressive, uh, yeah. mostly because I've been playing a lot of Blitz and Bullet without doing the required yeah. practice, and so it's just awful. But I love it. I, I pull I play online. I'm usually around fourteen to sixteen hundred uh, on on my online rating and various sites or what have you. Uh, but you, uh, you would probably I'm beat me, me, although I. I'll shoot you an email. Yeah, I, I'm a I'm a chess.com and on Lee Chess, and you would probably beat me, although I did I did beat a fourteen twenty rated player the other day, but I, they just kind of screwed up. I didn't really win. But anyway, I appreciate the call, Sean. Okay. Well, I appreciate. Yeah, I appreciate you taking my call, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll listen. go ahead and listen to the rest of the show. All right. Thank you. Yeah, it's one of those things where uh, there was a Twitter 
kind of argument going on, which I bowed out of and eventually blocked somebody, not because I, not because they're necessarily, or I was afraid to engage or what. I just found it taking up too much of my time and I don't want to debate on Twitter anyway with, you know, sure. here's, here's 20 ats and then a small chunk of text. And it, plus these are topics that you can just call into the show. Uh, so yeah, I'm now we know, so American Atheist has a slightly different reputation from some of the others. They, mm -hmm. uh, I know that when Silver Moon was running things, it was, you know, this view of, of being the firebrand, kind of the Marines. And he even had this notion that, well, if people look at American Atheist as the bad atheist, that implies that there must be good atheists. So we're actually doing people a favor, which I kind of get. Uh, and and it's, it's an organization that has atheists right in the name. Mm -hmm. And yet we are still going to be having conversations about, well, does that mean you don't believe in a God or does that mean that you actively uh, believe there are no gods? Sure. And at the end of the day, it's, it seems like a complete diversion to me because I live in a world where I am constantly amazed that there are as many people as there are who believe things that like seem obviously false. And yet, you know, like the, the flat earthers. And it's amazing that we're even dealing with that again. Right. Um, or, you know, notions about whether or not Trump lies. Okay? It's a fact. President Donald Trump lies. You know what? So do I. So do a lot of people. The thing is, that notion that we all lie and all politicians definitely lie. Like people lie this much and politicians lie this much. And so it's like, well, who cares if he lies? But if people lie this much and politicians lie this much and the president's lying this much, I think I would think that's an issue. Now, this is, I'm not saying that he's, this is necessarily the case and I'm not supporting any uh, party or anything else. It's just, it's an obvious fact. Mm -hmm. and, and he's not alone. Hey, there are bad people. This person's a bad person. And I know we don't want to say, like, George H.W. Bush died the other day. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was president while I was uh, in the military during the Gulf War. Uh, and while I was uh, still a Rush Limbaugh, ditto head conservative Republican. Oh, lovely. Um, but that doesn't really affect what I thought of him. There, there were things that I thought about him. I recognized that there were times when we could have political differences. Um, I, are, we, are we really getting to the point, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but it just seems absolutely more divisive and more in the case of there's single issue voters everywhere on all sides. And, and I'm not saying that's wrong because uh, Beth would say throughout the entire uh, 2016 election process was it's about the Supreme Court. Actually, what she would say is, it's about the goddamn motherfucking Supreme Court. She would post that, and that would be her only comment on the politics. And of course, we get to a, a, a situation where obviously the Supreme Court doesn't align with a majority towards what I would favor. Mm. Um, I do value the fact that there, you know, I would not want a hom homogenous Supreme Court. I, I, Certainly. I like the notion of dissent. But it seems we've gotten to this point where everybody needs a label and we have to do this label. And oh, by the way, you're not using my label correctly. And if you're not using my label, you know, you're a Nazi and I should disown you. Yeah. There's an incredibly frustrating element to that. And, and what reminded me from that caller is uh, here's somebody who's just trying to figure out how do I call what my position is? What, what label do I put on it? Sure. I'm not sure that there is a right answer. I mean, the labels are just, you know, abstractions that we apply to, you know, your position is your position. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, it's, it may be doing us a disservice in some cases. I'm not going to be dropping, we're not changing the show to the, the agnostic experience <laughs> or the we're not sure or maybe the unlabeled experience. I'm, I'm still an atheist and I'm happy to explain what that means. But certainly there's confusion out there. Mm -hmm. I, I am bothered by the agnostic thing because you're fundamentally answering a different question. Yeah. But that's a discussion for another time. Well, there, there's actually a, a flow chart that a guy put together, uh, the, guy, the guy that I blocked, and I'm hoping to someday have a conversation with him about it uh, because it's wrong at the very start. Hmm. Because the, the very first block is, um, is a question when the first block should be a statement. So 
in propositional logic, if you have a syllogism, the premises aren't questions, they are assertions. And as soon as you ask a question, you now have a dichotomy of answers. Whereas if you have a proposition, you either accept it or do not accept it, and there's, there's no middle ground. You know, are you convinced the defendant is guilty or are you not convinced? And this is completely independent from whether or not you are convinced of innocence. And if you began with the question, is the, is the, the uh, accused guilty? Uh, now, now you're asking a different question rather than accepting whether you accept a proposition because you provided both answers. Right. Anyway, hmm. uh, weird, weird self-serving diversion, which we'll stop doing uh, and try to get on to some more calls. So we, no, got, we do have plenty of time. But I don't know. It's going so fast. It's almost six. Oh, boy. We got to get okay. to it. Hey, uh, Jacob in Washington, thanks for waiting. We were, we were uh, here and ready to talk to you now. Hi. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, so you can hear me okay? Yes, please. Awesome. So, yeah, I am a Christian, and I believe that uh, morality is necessarily divorced from a God. Okay. Then we're and, in agreement uh, about everything except for the God part. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's very strange. Like in the last six months, you know, I have uh, changed my position on a lot of things, and it's, it's, it's I can tell there's a very strong, um, uh, what do you call it, dichotomy between what I believe and what I think I can show, and it, it, it's, it's very strange to me. So. It's a frustrating position um, to be in when you're, when you're convinced of something and yet completely baffled as to how you would show that it's the case. Yeah. yeah like, like if I, 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 that, I'm just going to guess, but if I were to ask you, why do you believe a God exists? I don't suspect you would have a ready answer. I think it would be fuzzier than that. Uh, because I'm avoiding an argument from authority. <laughs> you believe because you're avoiding an argument from authority. And essentially, that's, that's, uh, that's how I boil it down, because if you were to tell me there is no evidence for a globe Earth, I, and I said, okay, I'll, I'll take your word on it, that would be intellectually dishonest of me, because um, you know, the, the evidence is obvious and abundant. You know, a few thousand years ago, if you were to tell me that, in order to take you at your word, maybe do a little experiment here and there and be like, okay, hey, I believe you. But I, today... I, I know, apologize, that, but this seems backward to me. Yes. So you believe that there is a God. Are you saying that there's just abundant evidence for God? No, what I'm saying is, is I haven't done enough um, searching for evidence for God okay. to logically conclude that there is no God okay, but, or that there is no evidence for God. So, so here's the thing. Do you believe in Bigfoot? <laughs> no. Have you spent a lot of time researching Bigfoot? Not a ton. Have you spent <laughs> Have you spent as much time researching Bigfoot as you have God? No. So So there's a claim that you've spent less time researching and yet you don't accept it. And then there's a claim where you spent more time researching and yet you accept it because you don't think you've spent enough time gathering evidence against it. Do you understand that you've essentially shifted the burden of proof from where it should be? Like, if there is a God, that is a proposition which should not be accepted until there's sufficient evidence for it. Instead, there's a proposition and you're accepting it because you haven't found sufficient evidence against it. And if you were going to be consistent, then you should believe in Bigfoot because you haven't found sufficient evidence against Bigfoot, right? Yes, and I, 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 I almost agree with you because um, you know I, I, I come into the situation of you know like uh, I grew up and I, I would agree that I was indoctrinated into a young Earth Christianity and. Um, I, 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 I'm no longer young earth. I, I believe, uh, well, I, I accept evolution and I accept an old earth and I accept the, um, 13.8 ish billion year old, uh, universe, but 
see the the thing is i'm i'm here i believe in a god yes i i do believe there is a god so in order for me to change that belief i have to say okay but is but that what you're saying no. what you're saying right now jacob is okay instead of figuring out what a default position should be i'm just going to say that if i already believe it the burden of proof is to show that I'm wrong. And if I don't already believe it, the burden of proof is to show that I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. The the default position is definitely coming into the situation blind. The default position is don't believe it until there's sufficient evidence to show that it is real. That's what it should be. But what, you're, what you were implying just a moment ago is that because you already believe there's a God, you are putting the burden of proof on finding evidence that there's not. You know, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm not putting the uh, burden of proof on finding evidence against God. I'm, I'm, I'm tentatively. Well, I, I, I still, I, I literally still believe there is a God. Okay, what would change your mind? Say, I can't. What would change your mind on whether or not there's a God? I mean, you believe there's a God. What would change your mind? Um, either evidence to the contrary, or a sufficient, um, um, overwhelming body of evidence that there is no reasonable conclusion. Those are the same that. thing. You said evidence to the contrary, and then you said evidence that... Hey, hey how about I give you a or, third, or... third option? Yeah. So let's say you started, you believed in Bigfoot. And I were to ask you, what would change your mind? And you would say evidence that there is no Bigfoot. What if we were to show you that you were not justified in accepting Bigfoot to begin with, and that your only reasonable position would be to withhold belief until it's warranted. I don't think those are exactly analogous because we know that um, if there was a Bigfoot, you know, how we would find evidence for Bigfoot. And we have had numerous uh, surveys of, uh, you know, I guess we'll just take the, the Northwest Sasquatch version of Bigfoot, just like the Northwest area. We've had plenty of surveys, plenty of hiking, plenty of people out in that area. And um, just the amount of people that's been there, we should be able to find some type of evidence for Bigfoot. But um, and, and you don't think that in the entire history of human, you don't think that in the entire history of human beings with humans offering up a countless number of gods that they all seem to have experienced and yet can't provide evidence for, you don't think that that's roughly comparable? I, I, I mean, what evidence I do we have for a god? Is. I think first we need to know what the thing what is. The I don't know of any evidence. Before. Okay. So what you're essentially saying is you believe in something, and you don't know what the evidence is for it, and you'll stop believing it when there's evidence against it. And I'm, all I'm trying to get you to realize is that if we were to be intellectually honest, that should not be the way we think about anything. This isn't about a god. If you want to say, I believe that, um, uh, hell, I don't know, the moon is made of green cheese, and until somebody gives me evidence to the contrary, I'm going to hold that position. I mean, that, that is by definition what we would, we would call irrational. But see, part of showing me that um, the default position must be, um, you know, the lack of belief until there's evidence. Part of part of that lack of belief until there's evidence, your the burden of proof is on you to at least look for the evidence. No, 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 that's not that's not burden of proof. I would agree with you that, that if you care about the question, you have uh, your your best course of action is to go seeking. Uh, the evidence. But that would suggest that you really don't care whether or not it's true that this God being exists. You just want to believe it, which is why you haven't looked. Or maybe maybe you could argue that you haven't looked because you're afraid you'll find that you don't actually have any good evidentiary support for it. But Jeff mentioned something a minute ago, um, which we kind of glossed over, which had to do with defining God. And, and the way I would address that is this. You believe in a God which one and how did you decide that that was the God that was believable when others weren't? Yeah. Um, so with, with my job, I, I have uh, the ability to, to uh, listen to um, 
well, listen to, to stuff on my phone throughout the day. So um, I have been listening to just science talks, you know, mostly like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Krauss and that kind of stuff. Uh, about uh, four to six months ago, you know, the um, uh, the almighty YouTube algorithm uh, found me, you know, it just automatically uh, started playing um, the uh, one of your videos and one of Aaron Ross videos. And then I went from listening to science straight to, um, you know, atheism, atheism at that point, you know, about six months ago, it sure. actually, and so prior to that, it would have been an older, um, like, I hate to say it this way, but, you know, just a basic, you know, Christianity type God. I mean, that that, that is what I believe in. I, I hate to say it because, you know, which Christianity. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, up until that point, I didn't even care about the moral argument. It didn't, you know, it never entered my mind to even think about it. And then listening to your videos, um, you know, I, I can see now the issues with morality in the Bible, but I still believe in the Bible God. So therefore, the Bible God. Okay, I don't, uh, I don't know what the Bible God is, and I'm not just being obtuse. Um, yeah. For 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 Jeff, is there a way to define this better? But at the end of the day, what's going to end up happening is once you tell us what God it is that you believe in, the question is still going to be why, and if the only reason that you seem to be able to give is because nobody's proved that God doesn't exist. So it almost feels like you're beginning with this nebulous concept of God. And through the process of listening to science, uh, launching objections, well, clearly it can't be a young earth and it can't be this. And so you, you, you started with this wide definition of God and you're plucking all the things out and just clinging to whatever is left. And you're, you've established a methodology where you're expecting to keep clinging to that until every little thing of it has been removed. And my, what, I'm, what I'm trying to drive home is that every one of those little things that you are still clinging to need to be confirmed before belief is warranted, not disconfirmed before you give it up. And I, I would say before you even start looking for um, evidence, you need to have a clear idea of what it is you're trying to identify. Because yeah. the Bible God is a very vague thing. Yeah, and I, you know, what I, I realize Bigfoot doesn't necessarily work with everybody else, but, but to kind of beat the analogy to death, it would be like saying, oh, I believe in Bigfoot, but... I don't think that he lives in, you know, the Pacific Northwest because we've, you know, searched that area and blah, blah, blah. Or I don't think this is the case. Or maybe you could say, I don't believe they still exist. I believe they existed before. So as each little component of Bigfoot, you know, hey, there's this video footage, but we know now that this was faked by a couple of guys. So clearly that's not footage. And you're plugging, you would be removing everything else and yet saying, I still believe in Bigfoot. And, and the thing is, okay, what is left about the God you believe in that you can actually verify and have an evidential an evidentiary warrant for believing. Yeah. Well I, I, I can't find my note in the the minimal characteristics of God, but it would it would it would basically be um a, a all powerful or like basically maximally powerful God sure. that is omnipresent, omni. Sure, you're, you're going for the God of classical theism, the omnimax right. God I mean, of cla classical theism. The thing is, do you have any evidence that there is anything that is maximally powerful or omniscient? Well, that's this that's, that's, see, kind of close to like the the, the omni God or the the maximal God, but. Morality can't be in there, but also in order for it to be a God, it has to manifest in reality. If it doesn't manifest in reality, it's not real. Even if it exists, if it doesn't manifest in reality, he, she, it, or they sure. aren't real. This is, and, real and this is why I mentioned earlier to Jeff, uh, the problem of being able to 
claim to detect the undetectable. So you, you believe in God. You also believe that if it doesn't manifest in reality, it's not a God. So that leads to the question, in what ways has the God you believed in manifested in reality? Well, um, the, uh, I believe the, the Bible is basically or mostly true. Um, so it has interacted with um, people. Okay, so if I had said, in what ways does Bigfoot manifest in reality? And you had said, I believe the stories in Bigfoot are mostly true. Does that answer my question at all? Okay, so you're saying what ways does it manifest in reality? Yeah, you've said that a, a God isn't real if it doesn't manifest in reality, and yet you believe in a God. So I'm asking in what ways does the God you believe in manifest in reality? Do you mean to me, or do you mean like in the stories of the Bible? No, I mean, uh, go. I don't mean to, to jump in, but, you know, does... You have to. <laughs> does God, um, you know, part the waters? Does God um, cure people of illnesses? Does God um, reveal himself through visions to people who are sufficiently devout? But he, uh, even without specifics, you are convinced that a God exists and that a God must manifest in reality. And given only those two things, all I need for you to do is say, I am convinced that God, the God I believe in has manifested in reality in this way and then say whatever it is. And then I can either agree with you that that would be a manifestation of God or I can disagree that that would, you know, be reasonable to conclude that that's a God manifesting. But we haven't even got past the first step. Yeah, okay, so... Um, what does God do and how do you know he did it? Well, he, he performed the miracle for Jesus Christ and he... How do you know? Um, what, what, give me a miracle and how you know it's true. I, I have to say, I... Um, I believe it because that's what I was taught and I'm not a hundred percent sure anymore. Well, okay. I, I, it, it isn't about a hundred percent. If you believed in Bigfoot yeah. because that, which that's what you had taught and you say, but okay, I'm not a hundred percent. I'm not concerned that much about the percentage. Uh, I'm wondering why being taught something is in any way a justification of concluding that <laughs> that God exists or yeah okay well I I appreciate that and I, I appreciate the, the honest response I, I think honestly and because there's a bunch of callers here and I don't really see us getting much further um, think about that figure out what sorts of things you would find compelling what, what you currently find compelling uh, how John Loftus has this I, I, outsider test I, for faith I, I, and, and it's about what should convince someone else. So if I, were to tell you a, if I were to tell you all of this, everything that you've said about your God, if I were to tell you that I believe in a different God and had all the same reasons, would you find my case compelling? Absolutely not, but I didn't start out with a belief in your God. Yes, but you could say... I completely favor equal rights, but I didn't start out, fa you know, thinking that that uh, people of all races were equal. I started out thinking that my race was the preferred race, and 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 merely setting a burden of proof uh, to prove yourself wrong while acknowledging that this is just a de facto position you kind of started with and massaged. I mean, you, you, you've just acknowledged it wouldn't be convincing coming from somebody else. So why would it be convincing for you? Because I can't ignore what I already believe. You sure, know, you I, can. I, I already. You, you don't think you can change your mind? You don't. You don't think that. And oh, here's the I other question. Really changed my mind a whole lot in the last, you know, I mean, last five years, let alone just the last six months. I, I get you. And he, here's the other question: Are you actually convinced that a God exists, or are you just yes. okay? And and, I, and and for clarity, the reason I, you're convinced is because that's what you were taught. This is because I, I have all these all these things in the back of my mind, you know. You know, this can, like I when I was young, I had um, uh, the voice of God speak to me. Um, How do you know? 
because at the time um, it was telling me not to do something that was bad. But, yes, or, but how do you know that's the voice of God? Um, coming up at it as an outside observer, it sounds more like that was just my conscience telling me not to. But coming at it from where where I was at the time, I uh, just I don't have a way to to reconcile personal revelation. Well, yeah, you can't ever. But the thing is, yeah. recognizing that. So what if I told you that when I was younger, I felt that God had spoken to me in some sense too. And now I'm convinced that I was mistaken, that I had no good reason to reach the conclusion that it was actually a God revealing things to me. And how do I tell the difference between, and how can you set aside what I think of what you believe? How do you tell the difference between God speaking to you and you just thinking that God spoke to you? Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, if, if you can't maybe, tell the difference, then you can't it. claim that it was God speaking to you. All you can ever do is claim you, you thought God spoke to you. I, 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 maybe a better way to put it is, here's my belief in God. I'm going to take it, put it right here, put a pin in it. And I say, okay, we're going to put that right there. Now we're going to go and look for evidence. Um, the, the first part of evidence is is you know, listening to, to people who claim they have a proof for God. And uh, because I can listen to this um, on YouTube uh, while while I'm working, I have listened to you know a couple hundred formal debates, maybe more. Um, and I'm going to continue listening to those you know, because my job allows it. And then Jacob, that, I think that I think that too. before you before you delve into YouTube videos and whatnot, I th I think the best step for you to take is to really make a close examination of of it, of what it is that you believe. Because you know you may watch a YouTube video and 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 not realize that that person's idea of God is a fundamentally oh, no, I'm different. Not, I'm not just talking about a YouTube video, like like. Well, I, I mean, I'm just I, I, using that as an example, but um, well, I, I understand because Go ahead. because you can uh, you don't have to depend on others to reach conclusions on this if there is a god, um, especially one that talks to you. Well, sure. <laughs> um, so, so I would say take take some time to really clearly examine what you believe to be true about the deity that you believe in. And then try and, draw, try and look at it and say, okay, if this is true, then what must necessarily follow and see if that, in fact, necessarily follows. Well, that's, that's exactly what I'm doing. I, okay. Like I said, you know, I'm, I, I'm spending about 50 plus hours a week on this. Um, most of it is listening to talks, um, listening to debates, like I mean, I just think I'm very distinct. Uh, I, I think the biggest problem debates, like ones that are held at colleges and, and things like that versus informal debates, like YouTube channels and, and people having their own little discussions. And I'm listening to the it, Bible on, it, on, here's the problem, Jacob. Mm -hmm. If the God that you believe in is in fact unfalsifiable, then you will spend eternity waiting for someone to falsify it, and they never will. And so you will continue and maintain this belief in something which cannot be disproved. And that will tell you absolutely nothing about whether or not it's real. You have to begin. There's a reason why we begin with withholding acceptance of a proposition until it's warranted. Because if the proposition is unfalsifiable, which means there's no way to show that it is false then you will believe in a God, a nebulous, ill-defined whatever that talked to you once, forever, because no one will ever be able to prove that it's not true. And don't, do, do you see a problem with that? Because 20 people could believe in 20 different gods that are all unfalsifiable for their entire life. They have no hope of ever being proved false, and yet they will continue to believe this thing. And they can't all be right. It's, it's not about looking for evidence against God. It's about looking for evidence for God and not finding it. 
Yes, that's yeah, what it that's, should be. But what you've said repeatedly throughout the call is, you know, when I asked you what would change your mind, it was about somebody proving that there isn't a God. Well, so that, that was one one thing, which I'm not, you know, I, 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 um, that's one thing that um, would prove it easily. But the sure. thing is, 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 is if it's an and you, virus, you know what else would solve this? You can't prove it that way. But you, the other thing that you I know what else would solve this really that. easily? If God showed up and revealed himself to everybody, that would solve this too real easy, wouldn't it? Right. And, and why that's doesn't that happen? That's why the other criteria. Why, why doesn't that happen? The criteria is, that's a good question. Yeah. Ask God, and since he talks to on you, maybe he'll divine, tell you. On your divine hiddenness, yeah. Um, oh, where did I put my note for that? Problem of divine hiddenness. Well, while you're looking, Jacob, I, yeah. I, I wanted to jump back to the very beginning of the conversation because you be, you said that you believe in a God in order to avoid an argument from authority. Yeah. And uh, yeah. everything that you're saying, you're, it seems you're only looking at for evidence from authorities um, and also that you accepted the very first argument from authority that was made from you, from your parents, I presume, um, and then have um, at least consciously excluded all other arguments from authority, which is good. I would just argue you need to also exclude that very first, first argument from authority um, that was made to you, whether you knew it was happening or not. That's, that's the problem with prior belief. Yes. The only problem with prior belief, the only problem with prior belief is a refusal to accept when it was unwarranted. A dogged clinging to a concept just because it's cherished, because it was something, you know, it gives me, it gives me hope, it gives me pleasure, it, was, it came from my parents. All of those things, those are the things that keep us in prior beliefs. You know what, I, there's another name for prior beliefs, prejudice where you begin yeah. with an assumption or something that you were taught about a particular category of item or people or whatever. And it is very difficult to overcome that because it may not be the sort of thing that you're going to find even in a search evidence against. And if you just say, well, it's a prior belief, then it feels like you, have, you care less about whether what you believe is true than whether or not it is comforting or something you learned or prior, et cetera. But prior beliefs, it, yeah. all, all they do is prejudice your ability to, to, to objectively, as objectively po as possible, evaluate the question. And, and I understand that uh, I did come across the belief due to bad reasons. And that doesn't tell me whether or not it's true. Correct. And it doesn't. That, you, know, you can have bad, you can believe something for really bad reasons yep. and be correct. However, if all you have is bad reasons and you get rid of those, you need to find good reasons to continue to hold on to that view because you have no good reason to believe it's true. It may be true. It could be true that my socks are lucky. And if I walked in with a prior belief that my socks were lucky and expected people to, to prove to me that my socks weren't lucky, we would be here forever with me thinking of lucky socks. But if I realize that my reasons for believing that I have lucky socks were bad, it's not even a decision. You don't consciously... Prove that, that, that I'm wrong. You don't, even consci you don't consciously choose your beliefs. I, I, this, is, this is probably the sticking point and, and why I get occasionally frustrated in some of these conversations because... There's a missing component. If, if I care about what's true and someone comes along and says, and I acknowledge all of my reasons for believing this are bad and that they don't guarantee that what I believe is true. I don't make a decision to stop believing it. I just can't do anything else but not believe it. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so I'm wondering what else there is that you're clinging to um, because if you acknowledge that you have nothing but bad reasons then what's the good reason? Because I don't think I have... Stop. It hurt the last time because you did not stop. I won't, won't hear. 
Oh, um, sorry. Um, That's fine. That's all right. It happens. I don't think I've I've made uh, uh you know I know I've spent years just being apathetic about the question, so I don't believe that I've currently spent enough time looking into the evidence to what, what, change my belief. Go ahead. I was just going to say you could so, devote you could devote your entire life to that pursuit, and um, and and not find what it is that you're looking for, I think because of the way you're going about the search uh, or even undertaking the search itself. Um, well, that's, but that's, the thing is, if you say... Where do I stop? It, it, no, no, no. Why should you stop? Nobody's saying you should stop. What I'm saying is, if you have not, if you have not investigated this enough to conclude that you're wrong, then you cannot have investigated enough to conclude that you're right. That you, you are in no way ever forced to make a decision and make it permanent that I am absolutely convinced that there is a God or I am absolutely convinced that there's not a God. There's no requirement of that. It is, and this is why when I asked, I, I asked, do you actually believe that a God exists? And I didn't get to finish, but the follow-up is, or are you just convinced that it's a good idea for people to profess belief? But at the end of the day, I don't understand how you can say, I just haven't looked into it enough to conclude there's not a God, when that's not the thing that anybody's asking you to conclude. What we're asking you to conclude is that your current conclusion that there is a God is unwarranted. Or is warranted. It's like, it's like you, you walked into a courtroom and you're sitting on the jury and you began with a conclusion that the defendant's guilty um, rather than starting with presumed innocent. And halfway through the trial, somebody comes along and says, what do you think? And you're like, I think he's guilty, but I haven't really looked into it enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I mean, is, is that wrong? Is that not a, an accurate summary of kind of where we got to? I, I, don't, I don't think, it's, I don't think it, it works in this situation. I, I'm starting out... But that's a, I mean, uh, going from argue, from the argument of ignorance fallacy, um, that's special pleading, that this this particular belief or proposition is somehow special and, and warrants yeah. different treatment than, um, you know, is the sun going to rise tomorrow? I tell you what, I tell you what, there's a bunch of callers, Jacob, and I appreciate your time and everything, but I want to move on to some other stuff. So think about that. We don't want to, we never want somebody to call in and then just beat them up and blah, 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 and they got no answers. And this is, that is not the purpose no, of this. No, the so, reason I called is, is to learn. Yeah. And so think on those things, process those, come back with more and better or better, uh, different questions. Um, anything that's going to help the process learn, you're, you're welcome to call back, but I am going to move on to some other callers. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Okay. All right. I, 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 I wish I could have talked about morality instead. Well, I think we've spent quite a we bit did. of time talking today about morality over the course of two shows. So it'd probably be better to call back with that one on another week as well. But uh, thanks for calling in. I appreciate the time. I think, um, it seems like, you know, he started with he believes in a God to avoid an argument from authority. And I think he went two words too far. It sounds like he's believing in a God in order to avoid an argument. I think you're correct. Uh, it, that was, I'm glad you went back to that because it was a, that was the thing that threw me. I believe in God in order to avoid an argument from authority. I, I'm, I'm not sure how you can get to a God in that sense. That is a, a novel uh, yeah. way to come at that. But it's one, you know, I, one, one of the things is that I, I appreciate honestly trying to address the questions. I, I like it when people will acknowledge, um, okay, Maybe all my reasons are bad, but I still believe it. At least that's honest. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's truly the case that I think we should probably recognize more, and I'm probably as bad or worse about this than anybody. And that is, it's undeniable that I know more about the Bible and Christianity and religion than the average person sitting in the average church pew anywhere in the world. But only because, not because I'm the know-it-all, or the expert, I've legitimately spent more time uh, studying these things and engaging it. And by and large, most people don't know that much about what they believe. They don't, they know even less about why. Mm. Um, 
And it's because we live our lives by inference and induction and we're surrounded by people who share those beliefs. So when I ask people to give their reasons and I try to come up with analogies that to me would make it obvious, like this, the second I point out, you know, you've walked into a courtroom uh, with a pre-conclusion that your parents told you the guy was guilty and then halfway through right. somebody's like, hey, you believe he's guilty? And you're like, yeah, I believe he's guilty, but I haven't really studied enough. I'm not claiming I have good reasons. It's that to me is just immediately obvious, which is, I guess, why I, I choose those analogies. Right. To other and people, they're not. Fitting in a courtroom because, I've, you know, halfway through, the prosecution's the only one who's had yeah. the chance to talk. No, no, no. Wow. Yes. Yeah. This is why I need a lawyer around to, to remind me how the analogy is even better than I thought it was. Because <laughs> at the halfway point, uh, we've only heard the evidence for, for the guilty verdict. <laughs> All right. But the defense doesn't have to put on a case. They don't. If the prosecution doesn't make the case, the only realistic position the jury can reach legally is not guilty. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that I think ties into this God thing is you can have all the things in the world that, you know, led up to you kind of leaning this direction or whatever. But if they haven't met that burden of proof, if you haven't shown that God exists beyond a reasonable doubt, beyond for to preponderance the evidence or whatever the standard we're going to use is... Um, then you cannot consider yourself rational if you accept that God exists. I find God not guilty of existing. <laughs> yeah. All right. We've got uh, Jerry in Seattle. Thanks for waiting. Oh, yeah. Uh, no problem. Um, can I make a couple comments about uh, the previous callers before I go on? I can't stop you without hanging up, so go ahead. Oh, as an atheist community of Austin member, uh, I'd really like it if we never discuss the morality question again on the show. <laughs> it's just... Um, that's yeah, not going to happen. Just my, that's just my vote anyway. Yeah. It, it, it was just... It's sort of like the free will question for me. It's like, what's the point of even, even discussing it? I can, I can answer both of those. Thing, the, okay, point, the point of having those discussions is because there's disagreement and confusion and we do succeed in alleviating some of that confusion for some people and alleviating some disagreement for some people. So it's, it's one of those things where actually there's an article in that copy of American Atheist magazine from September, October uh, on page, I think, 20 or so by Tyson Gill, who has the opinion that we should be done debating. And I just released a video rebuttal to that on my own channel, uh, the Atheist Debates Patreon, uh, pointing out how I think that is probably one of the most asinine things I've ever heard, that we, in a minority position, facing a majority of people who understand, because he basically argues, oh, we should just not engage with them and only allow them to participate if, they have, if they're willing to operate on the basis of reason. Well, congratulations. And as I pointed out in the video, that's like saying, okay, there's 20 of us in the room. T two of us uh, don't believe in your God. And we're not going to let the other 18 of you participate in the conversation until you agree to do it on these terms. It just doesn't work. Yeah, yeah it's just that, yeah, I know. But see, I listen to like at least 75% of all of these shows. Yeah. And every time the, every time this discussion comes on, it's like, uh, nails on a chalkboard, you know? I, I completely get it, Jerry. I tell you this. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. You are not the reason that I have those discussions because you've already heard them. <laughs> Somebody else is yeah, hearing yeah, this yeah, stuff for the first time in a different way. And whenever you get frustrated, just think about how many more times I've heard and had the conversation than you have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, I, I, that's, enough, that's enough of that for me. Anyway, um, one other thing I wanted to bring up was I, you mentioned earlier that a lot of people hate you. I don't think anybody hates you or can hate you legitimately because you're such a fine person. Oh, you're wrong. Uh, I mean, I might uh, be a fine person, but there are people who hate me. I guarantee it. I've, I've spoken with them. Okay, but I'm just but yeah. telling you that I love you, man. I love you. Thank you very much, Jerry. But you anyway, had a question uh, about you're an atheist who prays? No, no, I'm a former atheist. Um Oh, you're a former no. atheist. As I, as, I, as, I met, as I mentioned, I am a current paid in full uh, atheist community member of Austin member. And, and in that vein, I want to challenge all other members 
which I'm going to do as soon as I get off hold, I'm going to go make a $25 donation. I'm, I'm challenging all members, including the hosts, to also make a $25 minimum donation today. Oh, well, I, I appreciate you coming on do, doing a fundraiser for us. Um, I, I will say that uh, while I'm not currently involved with the board of directors, um, it may be, you may have been a dues-paying member of the atheist community of Austin, but because membership requires that you be an atheist, if you're no longer an atheist, that might be a problem. Well, you know, I, I, I'm kind of kind of on the fence, uh, and I move from side to side. So, Well, let's hurry up and push you off that fence. <laughs> well, no, I, I don't think it can, because I actually witnessed God, uh, the voice of God, the visage of God. I've then how are you on the fence? Because I'm not sure it was actually God. Okay, that's good. Okay, so... Okay, um, uh, and, and uh, the there was a I great, qu I was, great oh. question by Jeff, because this is what happens, and, and I want to caution against this as much as I can. There's a clarity that needs to take place in these conversations. It's one of the reasons why I'm incredibly... I, th I think you might have noticed over the years, Jerry, I don't tend to give short answers. I talk a lot. And it's because I'm constantly terrified of being misunderstood, of not, of not getting to clarity. But when you say, I've heard the voice of God, seen the visage of God, that is fundamentally different from, I think I've heard the voice of God, or I think that I've... No, no, I actually have... I have... And now we're back. At what? And now we're back because I'm trying to explain the difference between you saying, I saw something which was God, and then Jeff asks you. So I think, I think he's had an experience. He's not, are you, is it yeah, that? I've had a revelation, a revelation. But you don't know the source? Uh, yes, I do know the source. Okay, See, this is... Then I'm, then I'm still confused. We, we, are, we are completely befuddled. Please tell us about your experience and how you know the source. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, I'll explain it to the point where you'll understand. Anyway, I was, uh, I was in the back of an EMT ambulance, and I do admit that this whole thing may be, have been drug-induced, but as far as I know... Wait, they, you, you they said you know the source, and now you're saying the source might be drugs. I'm just saying that I'm a realist, and I have to admit that possibility. So, okay. The, the point that, that Jeff and I were trying to get to is you, you are going back and forth. You're vacillating between claiming you know the source and then acknowledging that you might be wrong about the source. I'm saying, well, maybe I should explain the source, and then, you'll, and then you, can, you, can, you can debunk it or, or give your point, you know. I haven't really given you I, uh, what occurred at all, so. Okay. But, I, I think the thing we're, we're getting at is you said it was God, then you said you weren't sure it was God, then you said you were sure it was God, then you said it might be drugs. Do you understand why we're having difficulty? Um, well, yeah, I understand why you're having difficulty. See, the problem is I'm an extremely honest person, and I don't ever lie about anything. So I give you my unvarnished opinion, uh, 100%, and not in any way trying to deceive. I'm just saying... When I was in the back of this ambulance, I may have been dosed by these EMTs. I don't know. But then I started to feel the presence. And I, this is another thing that I admit is against my case. But I felt the presence of Jesus. And Jesus is the God. And I know it's stupid. I know that it shouldn't have been Jesus. It should have just. It should have been a woman like that Ariana Grande song. You know, <laughs> you know, it shouldn't have been the God I expected, because I, I was raised in America, like everybody else. I'm exposed to churches, Jesus, blah blah blah. I never went to church as a as a as a kid regularly, only on Easter and uh, stuff like that. And anyway, so I felt. See, I'm I was an atheist at that point. At that point, I was an atheist. I felt the presence of God, of Jesus, coming toward me from my uh, from above me, not above me as in the ceiling, but behind my head. I was strapped to a gurney. Uh, I felt the presence, and I said, "I talked to Jesus." I said, "Please do not come near me." 
I am unworthy. Do not come near me. Do not talk to me. Do not let me see you. I am unworthy. Please don't. Please stay away. And I covered my eyes and I covered my face so I couldn't see because because I felt so, so through my core that this was God. This was Jesus in his person and coming toward me, trying to, I don't know what he was trying to do, but anyway, um, and anyway, this happened several times where I felt like he was trying to get me to look at him, but I would not look at him because I was an atheist and I kept saying that I was unworthy. I was dirty. Uh, and I did not deserve such a revelation. Uh, and anyway, so this happened several times. And every time he came in, I throw my hands over my eyes so I couldn't see him. And anyway, I never saw him that night. But later on, like a few days later, I was driving. I, you know, and I also believe I have, I have actually seen the devil as well. And you're not going to believe this, but uh, the devil was driving a Ford Harley Davidson edition truck. And uh, anyway, uh, he was kind of fighting for my soul, him and Jesus, because I was an atheist still. And uh, I had decided that I was going to take the side of Jesus. I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to take the side. I wasn't going to be evil. I wasn't going to choose evil. I wasn't going to fall for the devil, even though that, you know, that's the, that's the um, way which is most pleasurable, you know, for, for somebody, you know, uh, money, sex, whatever, whatever you want, power, it's yours. I could have chose that, I believe, if I had went with the devil. Anyway, he uh, he basically almost rear-ended me. He, uh, I I was driving, and he was basically having a road rate incident with me, trying to run me off the road. And at that point, you know, we're not on, you know, that's it. I made no choice. And anyway, and so after that incident, I was driving down the road after he left on this trip. I was driving down the road. There was a guy walking in the same direction I was driving. He was on the right sidewalk. He had long, blondish hair, blondish brunette hair. He turned. It was Jesus in the flesh. And I just kept driving. Anyway, I think I later saw him again, this time a lot closer, uh, in the form of a homeless person with the same hair, the same, uh, and, and the same, you know, dis disheveled. But you see, the way, the way I, I admit you're right, Matt, you're right. And I was right as an atheist. I was right, right as a atheist community of Austin member. I was right. There's absolutely no proof there is a God. There's no proof there is a Jesus. There's no proof there is any other God. There's no proof there are monsters. There's no proof there are fairies, unicorns, blah, blah, blah. So, but I can't ignore my own senses, my own physical senses. And that's what, that's what, how I saw both Jesus and the devil and how I made the choice that if I was going to go with a, some entity like that, if they're fighting over my soul, you know, which I don't, e I don't even really admit, I don't think there is a soul, but you know, if you're seeing God, then hey, I got to stop here. There's a soul. I got to stop here, Jerry, because, Go you know, I don't want to be a dick. Um, I certainly, I can't, I have no words. 
I think, because th this is such a confused mess. I don't even know where we are in relation to being in the, having the EMTs work on you. And, uh, but, okay. Wow. I, Jeff, you got anything? Oh, I would, um, I, so I'm seeking clarification on a couple of points. Um, the uh, it seemed like you said that while you were driving and you saw the devil at that time you identified as an atheist, and also while it, when you saw Jesus walking along the side of the road, um, is that accurate? Am I understanding your story? Okay, it wasn't the devil that you're thinking. It was just a guy. Well, but the, okay. okay, but at the time you were no, 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 no fucking way. There's no way I'm going to sit here and listen to that entire story and have you emotional and telling me that this was the devil who was in a fight with Jesus over your non-existent soul. And then the second Jeff tries to get clarification, you're like, well, it wasn't the devil. It's just a guy in a truck. So why can't we conclude that the guy walking down the street was just a guy walking down the street and the homeless guy was just a homeless guy and that what you experienced in the EMTs is nothing at all remotely? Because I tell you this, I'm an atheist and I'm a former fundamentalist Southern Baptist Christian. And if I was in a position where I thought that uh, Jesus was trying to communicate with me, I'm never going to say, I'm not worthy, I'm dirty. Oh, I did. Y yes, that's what I'm saying. That me, the only type of people who would say I'm not worthy, I'm dirty, are people who predispose to believing this sort of thing anyway. But the the elements of your story make no sense and change every time we try to get clarification. Okay, ask whatever you want. It's not changed as far as I can tell. Was the guy in the truck the devil or a guy? It was, I just told the Jeff that it was just a guy. Then why did you say it was the devil? The why did you say it was the devil earlier? You were, and you were because fairly clear. He was, was just like the homeless guy was Jesus. I thought that this guy, this other guy that was basically trying to kill me with his truck was the devil. Okay, so you thought that, you thought the devil was trying to kill you, but now you don't think it was the devil. So no, he wasn't trying to kill me. He was trying to harass me with his truck. Okay, you said kill, but harass, whatever. Here's the thing. When did the, how long ago did this happen? Uh, six months, Max. Sure. Okay. So the correct way to tell this story is six months ago, there was a guy in a Ford truck who was being belligerent and I think was trying to harass me. And at the time, I thought maybe he was the devil, but he was just a guy. To tell the story. I have no way to, conf I have no way to prove that he was. You're not listening. You're not listening. Hey, go ahead. You just told us when we asked that he wasn't the devil, he was just a guy. So the honest way to tell the story is from the beginning. Well. No, no you, you're the guy who says you're honest to a fault. So let me point out the fault. The honest way to tell that story is there was a night where this guy in a truck was harassing me and I was convinced he was the devil, but I now believe that it was just a guy. That is fundamentally different from saying... I saw the devil, the devil was in this truck, it was a Ford truck, Harley Davidson edition, and the devil and Jesus were fighting over my soul. And then as soon as somebody asks a question about the guy in the truck, you're like, well, he wasn't actually the devil, he was just a guy in a truck. Do you understand how that makes you not yes. an honest person? No, I don't, because I'm right. telling you the truth, and the reason I believe that is because it was a revelation, it was what I felt. Well, what is a revelation? I a guy in a truck is a revelation? No, a revelation is you feel something. It's not necessarily something you see with your eyes or hear with your ears. What What was the revelation? Was the revelation Was the revelation that you were wrong about whether or not the guy in the truck was the devil? No, I actually still believe that he was uh, the personification. Okay, we're done. Uh, somebody out there is going to hate that and think that I'm an asshole for hanging up on that guy. There's four callers left that I want to get through the show and I don't want to disrespect them by having somebody tell me that he's blatantly honest. And then when we're pointing out and seeking clarification, he goes back, he went back and forth on almost every point. Yeah. And, and I actually have a note here from this call screener because he was listed as an atheist who prays. Right. Uh, and then switched to theist. And then it's, he switched it to theist and then the call screener says, Jerry's story changed. He said he's an atheist who believes in God. So I think there's some confusion there. I don't want to 
speculate beyond that about potential issues, and I don't want to demean Jerry, but at the end of the day, if you're calling in to tell us a story about your personal experience, and you're going to tell me that you're honest, don't make me dig for the information, and don't make my co-host dig for the information, where you're then like, well, okay, I thought he was, he was just a guy in a truck. He wasn't the devil. Well, he was the personification of the devil. Well, okay, they were fighting over a soul, and I don't even think souls exist. And this was, I don't and, even know that there's a good lesson. And he may have been medicated the whole time. Yeah. But why was he driving around dosed after, I, I don't know where the EMTs came into this story. Yeah, I was, I, I, ultimately it boils down to, you know, if you had a personal experience and that's why you believe, okay. And by the way, for everybody out there, um, and there's, there's more than a few of you I know because while I am not necessarily uh, the stereotypical person, there were quite a few people out there who I'm sure were listening to that story and letting their mind wander about particular phrasing uh, of things that were said that might have thought that this was all just a Poe, a fake caller who was maybe trying to get in some double entendres or work down that road. You could be right. I have no idea. But at the end of the day, I'm willing to let somebody tell their story and, in, and engage as long as we're not, like every time we raise a question, right. the around. universe doesn't flip upside down. You know, I'm an atheist who prays, but I'm not an atheist who prays. I'm a theist. I'm an atheist who believes in God. And uh, I had this experience, except I'm not sure it was experience. I, but I am sure that it was an experience from God, but I might have been dosed by the EMTs. And then I was in this truck and it was the devil and there was Jesus on the side of the road. And then he turned into a homeless guy, but Jesus and the devil were fighting over my soul. But it actually wasn't the devil. It was just a guy in a truck who I think might have been the personification. Oh my God. And I'm on the fence about whether God exists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm on the fence. Uh, no. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. All right. <laughs> We've got Ronald in Houston. Thanks for waiting. Welcome to the show. You're on with Matt and Jeff. Uh, hello. Uh, hey, guys. How's it going? Doing well, Ronald. How are you? It's, I'm it's going good. weird. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I can tell because of that call. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, what do you got for us? So, and you are lucky uh, because Jeff is here to answer things in a different way than I could about your, your particular issue. Yeah, true. Uh, so, let's see. So, um, first, I just want to say, uh, I guess, thank you. I don't want to go too much into my personal story. I just want to talk about an issue I'm having. But I do want to say thank you because, uh, as you can see from the call screener, I'm from Houston. Yep. And I've grown up in a really religious uh, community. My parents are Southern Baptists, still are. Um, so, I just want to say thank you for, you know, everything that you've been doing over the past I don't know how long you've been doing it, because um, it's really, you know, helped me out with a lot of stuff. So I just want to say thanks for that. Thank you very much. Um, that, mean, that means a lot. Yeah. It means a lot to me, that's for sure. So, yeah, I guess the main thing I wanted to ask is, um, so me being an atheist and my parents being Southern Baptist, I've been having some issues with, I guess, trying to get them to see where I'm coming from and trying to get accepted because they're very, they're very devout in what they believe. Um, I think, man, I think the one thing that could summarize it best was I was talking to my dad a couple weeks ago and I'm, I'm 20 by the way. So it's not like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at the point where I can civilly talk with them about these things, wing into arguments and discussions, but um, you're at that wonderful age about, where it makes it harder for them to just dismiss this as rebellion and yet maybe not quite, uh, viewed as mature enough to where they aren't afraid fair. of being disparaging. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and I honestly, yeah, I, was, I don't know Jeff's background here, so it'll be interesting to hear how he addresses this because while I have advice, um, I don't know that I've had that much success dealing with, with this issue with my parents, uh, so I might not be very good at giving advice on this. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I guess my mom is a lot more, I don't want to, I don't want to say irrational, but she's a lot more um, devout and a lot more, um, I guess, grounded in her roots and her faith. Um, I would ask her about the Bible and why she believes it. And she'll say, you know, because the Bible believes it, you know, circular arguments and stuff like that. And, sure. you know, I'll ask her, what's the proof of what you're saying is true? And she'll tell me that she's the proof. And she'll tell me that, you know, um, I'll ask her how. And she said, she'll say she's been changed. And I'll ask her how she knows that her being changed and a Muslim or a Buddhist being changed, you know, those sort of arguments. And 
you know, it's kind of hard to get through to both of them because, you know, they've been believers their whole life. And like I said, I'm in Texas, so I grew up in a really religious community. Most of even my extended family, like my aunt's uncles are religious. So it's kind of hard to communicate with them. You know, it's, it's kind of, kind of difficult. So. What's the goal? Um, I think my biggest goal, um, Honestly, my biggest goal would just to be to get them to understand that. Because I, I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to go too much into my story. But when I grew up, I, they did, you know, baptize me and all that. And now I'm an atheist. So I just want them to realize that what I'm doing is not what I'm doing, but where I stand and my atheism isn't just like, you know, to spite them. And it isn't like to, you know, to hurt them or isn't like a response to what they believe. I just want them to realize that. I believe, you know, or explain them about my lack of belief um, that it's, I've reached it on my own. You know, I've done the research, I've looked at things and I want them to do their own research. I want them to, you know, not just take my word for it or me take their word for it. I want them to, I guess, just be more rational like I have and get, and just, yeah, that sort of summarizes it. Okay. You, you gave a couple different goals, but I'm going to let sure. Jeff go. Um, so I think, I think that, the first thing to keep in mind is that you're not going to be able to achieve any of those goals by fiat. You're not going to be able to accomplish it um, just by sheer force of will. Um, yeah. I think, you know, when, um, you know, we, we actually had a call on Talk Heathen earlier that was uh, kind of similar to this um, with someone who was recently um, – deconverted um, and how how to talk with his father. And I think I'm going to give you much of the same advice that um, Eric and I gave him, which was, um, you know, when, when, when they bring up religion, um, and I don't know if you're starting those conversations or if they are, but I'm presuming that they are, um, you know, treat the subject with respect, um, but also – you know, actively, actively engage with them on subjects that you used to talk about before to, to show them, whether consciously or subconsciously on their part, that you're still the same person that they raised. You aren't – you haven't suddenly switched to a different personality or anything like that. Um, yeah. Uh, and – it's it's a struggle. I and and I count myself lucky because um, while while my parents are believers, it was not um, um, it has not been a hostile relationship um, since um, my. I mean, I I have no conscious memory of of actually believing in a in a deity, but it wasn't until I was in my early twenties, I think, that my mom realized that that was the case. Um, uh, and and I knew that she struggled with it, but I was also separated from them by about 500 miles. <laughs> um, so I didn't experience it in you know, directly what their response was. <sighs> so I can only give you, you know, my best effort uh, at to how to address the, the problem. Um, but... Um, I, honestly, if you want to go and look at the Talk Ethan episode from earlier today, um, you know, Eric and I spent a great deal of time talking um, with uh, Frud about uh, his um, relationship with his father and, and how he can go about maintaining it. And, and while I don't want to retread a bunch of ground, I also don't want to give you short shrift. Sure. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do everything you can to let them know that you, um, you know, you still love them. You're still a good person. You're still the same person that they raised. You just have a disagreement with them on this one point, and you know, talk about the things that you used to talk about when they bring up religion. You know, address the issue directly. Don't you know shy away from it, and and treat the conversation with respect because they are. They are struggling, um, and you know, uh, assuming that you care about your parents um, like most children, then 
you want them to understand and and um, and and get through the emotional crisis that they find themselves in. Um, you have two goals, and I'm not sure that that's. So one of the goals that you expressed was that you want them to understand, you know, that you're still you, that you love them, that you didn't, you know, you you came by this uh, through an intellectual process. But then you had a second goal of you want them to be rational as well. Well, yeah, I don't know. And, and the one thing is if the goal is for them to understand, you have to realize that neither of your goals are necessarily achievable. The best thing you can do is yeah. be yourself and communicate with them and explain it to them. You know, it's, it's the old adage of I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you. Um, and that's sometimes the best you can, you can hope for. Um, it, it, what happened on, on Talk Ethan, is there, is there a serious concern on the part of your, your parents that, that maybe they're just, they don't want to see you in hell? Is that the primary thing? I think... I think that's definitely a part of it. I think another part of it would also be that um, they've just, and I, I've listened a lot about your background. They were kind of taken aback, you know, um, by how, you know, because they thought for the longest time that I was a believer. And then, I, you know, yeah. I come out as an atheist and they're, you know, they misunderstand a lot and they don't, you know, comprehend what's going on. And there's that confusion and fear and all of that just like mixed up into this soup and it's not a good just, combination. Yeah, you can be open and talk to them. But one of the things that, you know, I, I said some things to my parents, which kind of helped smooth things over a little bit, which was, you know, you believe in God, you believe that God wants me to know he exists, you believe that he has a plan and that you should pray, and you know that just telling me your testimony isn't going to change my mind, so the best thing you can do is pray that it's part of God's plan for him to reveal himself to me, and that kind of took the obligation off their shoulders and put it back on God, but the other thing is, if the hell issue is coming up, uh, it's worth pointing out that I could look at my mom and say, I know that you are in pain because you are terrified that I'm going to burn forever in hell. I understand that. But you need to know that I'm in pain because your unwarranted religious beliefs have managed to make you miserable about the fact that I am happy and reasonable about the fact that I don't believe the same thing you do. And the process by which I should change my mind is fundamentally different between the two of us because you're convinced that I should change my mind just to avoid going to hell. And I'm convinced that I should change my mind just as soon as there's good reason to believe that that is the case. And it, that's, a, that's it, a really good point. Yeah, it's letting them know that you, you, this isn't rebellion. This isn't, oh, mom and dad believed in a God, so I'm going to stop believing in a God. It, it's nothing like that. And that their fear of hell is understandable given what they believe, but not acceptable. And given what you believe, it would be like, you know, ask them how many other religions, you know, what if you had converted to some other religion, they'd have the same fear. And the people that, you know, if your parents had been a part of a different religion and you left that one religion for another, they would have the same fear. So as you as an outsider, how do you tell which of these is true? Uh, but letting them know you exactly. care is probably the the most important thing because there's no telling what's going through their mind. You know, if you if you sincerely believe that, you know, the stories and everything else about hell, what could you possibly think about someone who you know does not agree with you and seems to be thumbing their nose at God? You know, yeah. If if you believe there was a mafia boss on the street. And that, you know, you didn't want your kid playing out in the street and, and, uh, and, and breaking the rules of, of the local mafia boss. You, you'd have a really good uh, justification to be fearful. But here's the thing. If they believe in, in a God that is loving, why isn't their God easing their discomfort with the notion that you're going to hell? Yeah. We're about to wrap up soon. I got to. I got to try to get to a couple other calls. I hope that's helpful for you, Ronald. I appreciate your time. Yeah, definitely. That's really helpful. And by I all means, you talking to me too, Matt. Yeah, by all means, call us back. Let us know how it went. Good talking to you, Ronald. Dude, thanks, Matt. Good talking to you too. All right, we got uh, Jesse in New York, and I think we may have answered your question in that last call. Yeah, pretty close. Uh, <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. All right. Uh, first of all, um, just. Uh, well, starstruck talking to you guys. I've been a long-time listener uh, since I was younger and everything. But um, 
Well, thanks for I making me feel it. old. <laughs> I had somebody come up to me at an event, and they were like, I've been listening to you since I was in grade school. And I was like, oh, my <laughs> God. That's just me. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not that young, but I'm a... Oh, we lost our theist caller. All right. Oh. uh, Uh, So one of the things, you you were basically calling in to talk about this notion of is it worthwhile to talk to family about changing their minds about religion um, because you hate to see your family being fooled, which is what I kind of addressed at the end of the last call. But there's one other thing that I would kind of add on it, and, and maybe Jeff's got some more to add too, and that is... Dan Barker is a friend of mine. He's co-president of the Freedom for Religion Foundation along with his wife, Annie Laurie. Uh, I'm hoping to go up and see them and, and speak with their group uh, in the near future. So if you're watching, Dan, I apologize. And Annie Laurie, I apologize. I haven't answered that email yet. But Dan had something nearly miraculous happen in that he had fundamentalist parents who are now atheists. He gave up his religion. And in the process of having conversations with his parents... They did too. I have absolutely no hope that that is ever going to happen with my parents. And so everybody's a little different. Um, I have family members who have changed their mind uh, to varying degrees. And I have other family members who flat out said, nope, we're closed-minded. Nothing you say is ever going to change their mind. It would be like trying to convince me that, you know, my son didn't exist Mm. type thing. So my, uh, you, you gotta you gotta judge with, it on your own. I hear you. My uh, my other problem with, with uh, my parents especially is uh, they've become more and more religious uh, as time has gone on, and they're Catholic. And I don't know if you probably have, you guys run into this, but they've almost um, become like cult like with certain uh, saints that will start to worship. Do you know what I'm talking about? They like yeah. attach to one saint specifically, and there's a lot of uh, I don't know, almost like rituals that go with just that specific thing. Well, it's like scary almost. Like they're genuinely becoming cult-like, and it's uh, it's scary to watch. So yeah, I was just kind of, I you know, I don't know, trying to get some reassurance. I, I not only watched, uh, you know, talk to watch the emotional damage that religions have have done to people. You know you know, making them sad that their kid's going to hell or whatever else. But there's also a lot of other ways that some stripes of religions um, do other damage to people, financial damage and mm. and, and other things along those fronts. I'm going to give uh, Jeff the last word on your call, and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, boy, um, you know, uh, I, I can completely understand, you know, you don't want to see your family being taken advantage of. Um, and the, the problem is, I I don't know that there is a you know a silver bullet for, um, you know, giving them the tools that they need to prevent them from um, falling into the traps of you know oh the religion deserves ten percent of your income or um, you know buying all the little. Um, tchotchkes of whatever patron saint that they've adopted. Um, yeah, I. Uh, it's a tough. Know, it's, it's a tough thing because on the one hand, there are things religions do, which I would say have no relevance to the truth, that mm-hmm. make people feel better about themselves and their life. The problem is most of what the religions are good at making people feel better about are the things that religions made them feel bad about in the first place. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not like it's, like, uh, it's going to give you, if you're, if you're being audited by the IRS, um, you can pray all you want and it might give you a little bit of comfort or whatever, but what's going to happen is going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and it's frustrating to watch people, from our perspective, being taken advantage of by religion. But if the religion they believe is something that you can't falsify, if it's something you can't show is wrong then the best thing you can do is to let them know that you're concerned about this, but that you value their, their life, their relationship with you, and want them to um, live the best life they can, and you're not convinced that necessarily participating in you know, cult-like scenarios and stuff is a good thing, but that in much the same way that you're, you have concerns about them but care about them having joy and expressing their freedom, you understand that they care about you and want the best for you. Um, and maybe set the religion aside and have a conversation about how we can determine what is or isn't best for us. 
Uh, and if it, if it just keeps going back to religion, I hate to say it, sometimes that's just the way it is. It's one of those things, yeah. you know, free, I'm a huge free speech component. The problem is, is that that means I have to allow all kinds of speech that I don't like. And I will always allow all kinds of speech I don't like because guaranteeing that people are free to speak on the things that I disagree with uh, means that I get to speak without being silenced. And that mutual respect for individual autonomy and freedom uh, may be the best course of action you can take when a religious belief is causing conflict between the two. You believe what you believe, I, I believe what I believe. And if we can't get along that way, then... I have, unfortunately, removed people from my life because their influence is toxic, and that includes some family members, and it's painful. Um, and maybe somewhere down the road, one of us will change our mind through somebody else, and it'll make things better. But yeah, on that note, you. Jesse... Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I got to let you go. Appreciate that. Holy crap, it's 7.05. <sighs> Now, we ran long today, and we didn't do it as a Patreon after show, but I want to thank the Patreons at, at, uh, our patrons at patreon.com uh, for their support. Thanks to the people today in the uh, Super Chat who raised $1,527. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're clapping. Take that, Eric. <laughs> but, what is that? That's like $3,000 today. Yeah. It, it, it was a really good day, and we're going to give all the credit to Jeff for coming down from American Woo! Atheist to educate us. Thank you guys so much for coming out, all the people on the other side. Let's show the people in the back booth there, Mark and Vernon, and everybody who make this show happen. We'll be back again next week, and I'll be in Dallas on December 15th. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.